At their very first meeting, Dr. Wayne Dyer and Dr. Deepak Chopra experienced that special magic that comes when two people are destined to become the best of friends. Since that time, they have gone on to delight audiences nationwide with their wisdom, compassion, and humor. Even though they were born on opposite sides of the globe and grew up in very different cultures, Dr. Dyer and Dr. Chopra evolved along similar paths. They both earned doctoral degrees, Dr. Dyer in counseling psychology, Dr. Chopra in medicine, and they embarked on successful careers in their chosen fields. However, like all great thinkers, they soon realized that they had more to offer than was available in the confines of established doctrines. Setting out on their separate journeys, they explored concepts and ideas ranging from the texts of ancient philosophies to the latest scientific advances. Today they have emerged as world leaders in the fields of self-development and mind-body medicine. These best-selling authors have brought us The Sky's the Limit, You'll See It When You Believe It, and Real Magic from Dr. Dyer, and Quantum Healing, Perfect Health, and Unconditional Life from Dr. Chopra. They have separately authored many audio tapes and have appeared on major television and radio shows worldwide. Recently, Dr. Dyer and Dr. Chopra met again at the Church of Today in Warren, Michigan to create a very unique event that Quantum Publications is now pleased to offer you. The program begins with individual talks by Dr. Dyer and Dr. Chopra and concludes with a highly entertaining interaction between these two great minds. This tape series is dedicated to the memory of Rev. Jack Boland, a great friend of mankind and a true believer in living beyond miracles. Now let's join Dr. Wayne Dyer. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I would like to introduce, before I begin, my soulmate, my, my precious wife, the woman who is so supportive and caring, the mother of seven of our children, the person who really guides me. When I heard Bette Midler sing, You Are the Wind Beneath My Wings, <laughs> I knew that she was dedicating that to my wife, Marcy. Marcy Dyer is here with me today. I love you. I said to Marcy not too long ago, because you wonder, I said, if I didn't have all the money that I have, <laughs> would you still love me? It was just a question. It was. She said, of course I would love you. She said, I'd miss you, but... I would still love you. <laughs> no, she didn't really say that. <laughs> and so, uh, this special day is born. A day that, uh, that I've dreamed about for a long time. The way that Deepak and I came together is really an intriguing story to me. It's, um, it's really an example of what the message we both have in our books and tapes and our live performances around the world. That there are no accidents, that the universe is on purpose, that uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, that the right person will show up and has always been there. I mean, this is very a man that grew up on the other side of the world, in New Delhi, the uh, son of a physician, a man who went to medical school, who lived around the world and uh, became a world-famous endocrinologist. And I grew up a little bit before, but not much, <laughs> here in Detroit delivering pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
We come together in a strange set of circumstances when my wife discovers that she has a uh, growth on her thyroid and um, has gone to several physicians, all of whom have told her that uh, she's going to have to have surgery and that it could be cancerous. And uh, my wife has a very powerful um, knowing within her. It's very different than a belief. It's beyond believing. It is, uh, I've seen her do it in uh, giving birth to uh, five of the births of our children. I was there and I watched her go into another state of consciousness and literally uh, uh, become some other human being as she went through this uh, process of uh, without ever complaining, without ever uh, whining, without ever asking for any medication or any help, using this very powerful inner source and, uh, and teaching me how to go along there with her <laughs> to do it. it was, I've seen her do that, and I knew that she had this knowing when she was uh, told that, uh, that she had this growth. Now, I had heard of uh, the name Deepak Chopra uh, as just a funny Indian name. Um, I mean, whose name Deepak? I mean, please. <laughs> I promise you, at Denby High School, there wasn't a Deepak in any of my classes. <laughs> and I'm sure in New Delhi, there wasn't a Wayne either. <laughs> and so I uh, called the people at Nightingale Conant, who produced my tapes, and I said, I would like you to send me the best tapes that you can send on self-healing. And they said, well, we only have one that con constitutes the best. And they sent me Magical Mind, Magical Body. And I listened to them that day. And I turned them over to my wife. And she listened to them. And she said, uh, I've got to meet this man. I've got to ask him about this uh, thyroid thing. And lo and behold, the next Saturday, Deepak and I were on a program together in San Francisco <laughs> that Louise Hay has been putting on Visions of the Future. And after his talk, early in the morning, I was speaking in late in the afternoon and he was on in the morning, I went over to this man where there were hundreds of people standing in line asking for autographs. And he stopped and he turned around and he looked at me and he said, I've always respected and admired you. Now this is a physician. <laughs> It hasn't ever happened in my life that a physician, <laughs> an MD, <laughs> has turned around and said those words to me. And I had an instant, what they call in Buddhism a satorai, a, an instant kind of awakening, a, a feeling of love for a man that I don't think I'd ever experienced before. It was like, it was like a, a falling in love in a moment. I felt an enormous kinship. I, I felt that we were brothers who were brought together from different parts of the world. Three weeks later, we were again on the same program in Seattle, and I told Deepak about the, my wife's thyroid, and he said, bring her to Seattle. And we flew out to Seattle and spoke again and had lunch. And since that day, we have become fast friends, colleagues, and my new book, which will be out um, in about two months, is dedicated to Deepak. My wife went to the Ayurvedic Health Center in Lancaster, and at the end of a week, with her knowing and with meditation and panchakarma treatments, she had shrunk that nodule down to where it's almost invisible. So there is something that brings people together. Thursday night, Marcy and I had dinner with the sixth man to walk on the moon, Edgar Mitchell. Someone you might want to think about bringing to your church sometime, Michael. A wonderful spiritual man. Dr. Mitchell and his wife, Sheila, 
And I got, we were talking in this restaurant, this Thai restaurant in, in uh, Florida. And he talked a little bit about his experience in space. And one of the things that he said that he had when he was in space was this incredible awakening. When he, let, when he came back in, from the Apollo 14 mission in 1971 after walking on the moon, he left the astronaut corps very shortly thereafter because he no longer felt that he was a scientist. <laughs> he, was, he had gone from being a scientist to being, being a spiritual metaphysician. He had an awareness, he said, that there are, there is an intelligence to this entire system that we all find ourselves a part of. And that intelligence, even though it's invisible, is so powerful and so perfect. He said, I looked to the left and I could see an infinity of perfection. Every single planet and every single star to infinity was perfectly synchronized and in perfect movement, moving at thousands of miles an hour to who knows where and from who knows where. All connected by some invisible thread of nothingness. And he said, I looked to my right and I could see this tiny blue planet about the size of a quarter. And on that quarter, as you looked from the perspective of walking on the moon, were all of our troubles and all of our difficulties and all of the things that we think are so important in a quarter, cumulatively, all five and a half billion of us on this little quarter. All of our worries of whether or not Michigan really can beat uh, Cincinnati. <laughs> Can five freshmen really do this? <laughs> all of the concerns that we have, all of the freeways and all of the traffic jams and all, and all on this little quarter. And he said that moment was a satori experience, an instant awakening. So you begin to develop as you... As you become more tuned in to this higher consciousness that we'll be talking about here today and begin to tap into it and use it, not just as uh, something that to dazzle your friends with, but as a way to create a, uh, a life of miracles. As you get good at this and, and have this knowing that healing and abundance and happiness and relationship perfection and all of the things that we seem to think are not within our purview to have all become everyday miracles. This consciousness, this, this invisible something or other that winds through it all, we get obsessed in our culture with what you call it. You know, what is its name? We fight wars over what you call it. <laughs> and it isn't at all what you call it. It doesn't matter what you call it. It doesn't matter what label you place on it. As Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian, reminded us, once you label me, you negate me. <laughs> and the same is true for this invisible intelligence that allows this whole universe to hang together from the tiniest little cell in our body to the planets moving and to the galaxies beyond. This invisible intelligence makes it all work. It's interesting when you try to get a perspective on what it is and how it works. When I arrived for my second visit to Lancaster in February, I had been having a dream, oh, for the last uh, couple of uh, decades, about uh, being out in the middle of the woods. And in, these, in this woods, I would walk along, and I would all of a sudden come upon a, uh, a beautiful pond. 
and it would be frozen over. And I would put on my ice skates, <laughs> and I would just skate effortlessly through, and I would see the trees, and I would hear birds, and, and the snow would be... I was like, this, this, and it would be a, it's a repetitive dream that I've had over and over again since I was a young boy. See, I grew up not far from here, in Mount Clemens for some years, in a series of foster homes, and then on the east side of Detroit when my mother got her family back together. And after I would deliver the free press in the morning, this was after the Times <laughs> folded, um, I would then go over and, uh, and play hockey. And I played hockey almost every day after school and on weekends down on the Detroit River. I really loved to do it. And I was a defenseman, so I could, I, you know, you really get good at skating backwards and gliding. And when I watch the Olympics, I can do all of those funny little axles and double twists and all of that stuff that they're doing. And skating is just like a way of life with me. I mean, I really, I can feel myself doing it and gliding through there. But the last time I had ice skates on was 1958. <laughs> 1958, the year I graduated from high school, <clears throat> was the last time I had ice skates on. But see, always in my dream, I had this knowing. And I've talked about this here in this church, at services that I've given. Is a knowing that is something that is present in you at the cellular level. In every cell of your being, you have this powerful knowing. Like, if you've learned how to ride a bicycle, and you've been on a bicycle, and that's a very complicated physical act, to be riding along on a bicycle. <laughs> I mean, two tiny, little, thin wheels, and you're twirling around corners and going no-handed and, and all that. You know, you have a knowing, not a belief, that you can do that. And any one of you can go out and pump up the tires and do that, even if you haven't been on a bicycle in 25 years. You know it, you don't believe it. Or you can dive in the water and you know you can swim even though you haven't been there for a long time. This knowing is something that is beyond this body that you're in. You see, the body that skated in 1958, backwards and twirls and circles and, and crashing people into the boards and, and all of that kind of thing, that body is not here today. <laughs> I'm here in a different model. <laughs> in some ways, I've outlived that model. The physicalness that allowed me to do that and the memory that is where it was stored, every single physical aspect of that body is gone. It's not it's not here. It's someplace else. And every cell in that body of 34 years ago has been replaced by brand new cells several times over. And even the brain that you think is where that information, that knowing is stored, even that brain is different than the brain physically. Like if you did a chemical analysis of the brain in 1958 and the brain that is here today and sent them to the lab, you would, it would come back and you would find that none of the cells are the same. They all have changed. But the knowing is still there. Now that's very powerful because when I got to Lancaster, the first thing I did, it had been about record cold for, oh, 10, 12 days. It had been below zero every day for the last couple of weeks. And so I went for a walk where I had been in the fall where I had found this pond and I walked out to this pond and there was the pond in my dream. It was exactly the same. It was like I recognized it. I had practically manifested it from this thought process and there it was. And it was frozen solid. It had not just ice, it had what we used to call black ice. <laughs> That's the best ice. That's more than 16 inches thick. And you can look down and all you see is blackness. 
beautiful ice, just exquisite ice <laughs> for skating. But I didn't have any skates. And there was one kid who works there, named Mark, who works in the kitchen, who was out there skating around in a very amateur way, I must say. <laughs> so I said to Mark, I reached into my pocket and I gave him some money, a lot of money. <laughs> and I said, Mark, I need a pair of skates today. <laughs> he said, it's Sunday. I said, I need skates today, Mark. And you can keep the change. And that afternoon, a pair of skates was manifested. <laughs> Brand new hockey skates. And I walked down to that pond that afternoon and I put them on. And there I was. I skated 23 hours that week. Just every day I would go out there and I had the time of my life all by my, just living out this wonderful fantasy. And what I want to suggest to you is that the knowing, the powerful knowing that was there, that I could do that and I could still have all those moves and, and they were all there and I didn't fall one time the whole week. And I was able to do all of the things, even though I had a brand new body and a brand new brain and nothing left of that physicalness, whatever that intelligence, that invisible intelligence is that allowed me to do it before, it had somehow transcended my physicalness. And I suggest to you, and Deepak will bring it home powerfully to you, <laughs> that this intelligence is something that we can all access and create not just what we do in our physical world every day, which is where it all comes from, but we can begin to create miracles for ourselves in our lives. Aldous Huxley, in the perennial philosophy, he talked about three things that all ages of man and all civilizations since the beginning of time all have had in common about what I'm talking about here this morning. All ages, all civilizations, from the ancient cavemen and their totems to the African traditions to the New Guinea traditions, to the European and the Eastern traditions and the Indian and the Japanese tradition. And these are p people and places that have never intersected with each other in a physical way. All of them have had what, what Huxley called three things they have in common. If you look at the philosophers, the people who have spoken for their people at that time, they've all believed that there is an invisible intelligence beyond the world of the changing. All ages of man somehow their most enlightened beings know this. There is an invisible world beyond the world of the changing. Number two, all ages, all civilizations who've never intersected with each other have all believed that that invisible intelligence is a part of every single human being. All ages. That it isn't something that is, some people get and some people don't. It excludes no one. And three, all ages of man have known and believed that the purpose of life is to discover God or to discover whatever it is that you want to call that invisible intelligence that suffuses all form in the universe and allows not only you to take notes and to ice skate, after 34 years of being away from them. But it allows the flowers to grow and it allows the planets to align and it allows the whole thing to exist. So if you want to call it God or soul or spirit or consciousness or Ralph, it doesn't really make any difference what name you put on it. It is not what you call it. It is in every one of us. We all have it. We couldn't be here without it. See, you will discover, as I discovered when my grandmother died, that uh, when they weighed her just before her death at the age of 94 at Henry Ford Hospital, 
that uh, she weighed 133 pounds. And then after she died, and there was this package, this container left that they were preparing to embalm. It wasn't my grandmother. <laughs> it was now just a package. That it weighed 133 pounds as they waited for the death certificate. Powerful metaphor there for me in that moment was that whatever it is that constitutes your very life, <laughs> it doesn't weigh anything. When life leaves the package that you showed up in, the package weighs the same. So your life is something other than the package. And when you get that, you understand that who you are is really this soul with a body rather than this body with a soul. Or as I said, and you'll see it when you believe it, you're a human being. You're not a human being having a spiritual experience. But you're a spiritual being having a human experience. But the quality of that human experience is dependent upon how able and willing you are to make contact with that invisible intelligence that suffuses you and all form in the universe that is independent and outside of this physical form that you showed up in. This physical form that you showed up in was all handled for you in a split second. All handled in this infinitely, in infinitesimally tiny speck. In this little speck when two little drops of human protoplasm collided Everything you needed for your form was handled for you. And you can't even begin to comprehend it. A heart starts beating inside a mother's womb <laughs> six or seven weeks after conception. And it's a complete and total mystery to everyone in the scientific world, in the medical world. In the, in the, the only people that even have a grasp on it are the poets. <laughs> Whatever that something is, that invisibleness <laughs> that allows you to be, what I want to suggest is, we'll call it, just for the purposes of my presentation here this morning, we'll call it uh, awareness, pure awareness, because it's also a term that, that Deepak uses. You see, if you go back two or three hundred years and look at how our current, say, theology and psychology and sociology and our views on humanity have evolved. They really have evolved from our scientific positions that we have taken. If you go back a few hundred years, the whole world was uh, enamored of uh, what is called Newtonian physics. And in Newtonian physics, they had a postulation that there was the world of matter, the physical world, and that we are made up of this physical world. And this physical world has got building blocks and that the smallest building blocks of the physical world were these things that they called atoms. And these atoms had within them electrons and neutrons and protons. You studied all of this stuff in physics. And, um, and that was it. The physical world, the building blocks of the physical world were these things because that was as far as we could go. And so there was the physical world made up of atoms. And then there is the non-physical or the non-material world. And that is over here. And since it isn't made up of this stuff here, in order to experience this over here, we had to have something called faith. And we created this faith, this belief that the spiritual world was something outside of the physical world, which was made up of these building blocks which we could see with our powerful uh, microscopes. Now we come along to the 20th century and we discover that there are things called quantum physics. And this quantum physics takes these building blocks that we used to think of as the very tiniest particles in matter called atoms. And today with our electron microscopes and our fantastic measuring devices, 
we have discovered that these <laughs> these things are like these atoms are like balloons. <laughs> I mean, they're huge. And so, what we've done in quantum mechanics and quantum physics is we have uh, broken them down into subatomic particles to find out what are the building blocks of nature, what are the physical qualities of nature, and we've broken them down. And we break them down, and we break them down into tinier and tinier subatomic particles and tinier ones, and we come up with fancy names for them. And uh, Deepak knows the names of all of this stuff. <laughs> he writes about all of this in a way that you can understand, which is about the only person in the world doing it. And then we discover when we get down and just keep breaking these little quarks and flarks and marks and all of this down into tinier little subquarks, and we, we find out that the building blocks of nature, as we get to the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest particles, that there's no more particles. <laughs> that the, the stuff that we're made up of is not something outside of us. That at the very tiniest levels, these things that we used to think of as particles are no longer particles. <laughs> but in fact, are pure energy or pure awareness. And that physical and spiritual are not separate from each other, but in fact are connected. And that the very thing that we used to think was outside of us, and something that we just had to have faith in order to experience our spirituality, we have now discovered scientifically that it is the same. It is us. That particles at the subatomic level don't behave like particles. <laughs> that they're all connected. That there's some kind of invisible force at this tiny, tiny microcosmic level that connects everything. And that in physics, if you take an atom and you take the electrons in an atom and you start aligning them uh, and manipulating them and you get enough of them in a line, after you reach a critical mass, all the rest of them align magically. Some kind of force is there when you get to what they call this critical mass number. If there's, let's say there's a hundred, if you get to 20, 25, the other ones stay out there, you get to this critical mass, boom, all the rest start lining up. And they call this in physics, they call it phase transition. Now, isn't it interesting to speculate that if we are made up of these things, that in fact, as is the tiniest part of us, so is the Cosmos, so is the external, all the intelligence that's within each cell, which is what Ayurveda teaches, is also outside of us as well. And that if every atom within us has that force to align itself, that maybe, just maybe, the same thing is happening right now. <laughs> that if enough of us individual atoms called Wayne and Deepak and Marcy and Sally and Bill begin to align in a certain kind of way that this thing that Carl Jung talked about, this collective consciousness, is something that we can begin to prove with our physics. You know, it was only 40 or 50 years ago, back in the 50s, that you would ask a scientist, do you believe in God? And they would say, of course not, I'm a scientist. <laughs> now you ask a scientist, do you believe in God? And 95% of them will say, of course, <laughs> I'm a scientist. <laughs> Because metaphysics, beyond the physics, are beginning, the physicians, the physical only people, are beginning to say what the metaphysicians have been saying forever. <laughs> As you think, so shall you be. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Even the least among you can do all that I have done, and even greater things. You will not be punished for your anger, you will be punished by your anger. So said Buddha. So said Christ. So said Muhammad. So said all of the spiritual masters who have ever walked among us. And now the scientists are beginning to say, it is within you. It isn't outside of you. And so we have joined forces. And now the poets who were writing like Blake in auguries of innocence to see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower to hold eternity in the palm of your hand and infinity in an hour 
We are led to believe a lie when we see with, not through the eye, which was born in a night, to perish in a night, when the soul slept in beams of light. That is so powerful. You were led to believe a lie. When you see with, not through the eye, you can't see with an eye. We have a friend who was blinded in, a, in an accident years ago. I'm Sharon Kamlos, who's been here. Either one of us would give one of our eyes so that she could see. <laughs> she can't see with an eye. You see through the eye. The eye doesn't see. The body can't see. The body can't hardly do anything. <laughs> it's what's directing it inside. Deepak has this wonderful illusion, this wonderful metaphor that he uses where you can go within your body and you can find the command center, <clears throat> but you can never find the commander. Somewhere in there, there's a commander. You can find all the cells, but you can't find who's doing that. That's that something, that mystery. And that, that lie that we've been led to believe is that who we are is this physical body and that it is limited. You see, the physical body, our physical body is what keeps us separate from each other. You have a different body than I do. And you believe in that body and you believe that you're separate and therefore you believe in there's things for you and there's things for me. But on a round planet, somehow we've got to learn, and we are in a new phase transition, that on a round planet, there's no choosing up sides. <laughs> there are no sides. And we have to discover that not at the physical level, because that's the lie. The physical level, you were born in a night to perish in a night when the soul... <laughs> which is another name for it, <laughs> slept in beams of light, formless, dimensionless, beyond the world of the physical. And so you become and know that you're this spiritual being having this phenomenal human experience. But your belief is so strong in the lie that Blake refers to that you are separate, that you are not connected, and yet, if a hijacking, a hijacking takes place in Cyprus, what connects you to the people on that plane, even though it's thousands of miles away on the other part of the one song, the Una One Verse song, one song, on the other side of the one song, what connects you is those feelings that you have for those people who are sitting there staring down the barrel of a gun. Your thoughts, that invisibleness connects you and you literally can feel their pain. And when you get good at discovering this higher part of yourself is the subject of our dialogue this afternoon. I can't wait for it. <laughs> Deepak has just put out a whole program on this. I just finished the last tape uh, just the other day called The Higher Self. Wonderful tape. Six hours of bliss. <laughs> you see, the lie you've led to believe look, works like this. You look at levels of awareness. And you look at a stone. Now a stone, at the quantum level, is alive. Do you know that if you take a stone and you crush it, and you pulverize it, and you make powder out of it, and then you pulverize it even further and make it as, as malleable as you possibly can make it, maybe even into liquid, and you send it off to a lab, and you send your brain off to a lab, and you get back the chemical analysis, that is the same. <laughs> There's only so much stuff in the universe to make up the world of form. How, what, with so much carbon, there's so many, there's so, so much hydrogen, there's so much oxygen, there's so much nitrogen, there's just like a, a handful of this stuff. 
And it makes up a stone and it makes up your brain and it makes up your arm and it makes up your nose and it makes up your house and it makes up your car and it makes up the chair and it makes up everything. It makes up a rhinoceros's horn. <laughs> the same stuff that makes up you. And you believe that you are that stuff? <laughs> Don't you see that there's an organizing intelligence that takes carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen and whatever all of those other chemicals are and says somehow in all of its perfection that Edgar Mitchell described, <laughs> all of its perfection it says this will organize in such a way that it becomes a horn and this will become a stone and this will become a human being. <laughs> and that stuff is just everywhere. <laughs> and then... You look at this stone and you say to yourself as you look at this stone, well, yeah, okay, it's got the same physical properties as I do, but it certainly has, let's just say it has no awareness. I mean, what awareness does a stone demonstrate? <laughs> it just sits there. You can kick it. You can do anything you want to it. And yet, at the quantum level, it has enormous awareness. If you let it sit there, for a million years, in the right conditions, it might be a diamond. <laughs> and in a million years, at the quantum level, is a speck, because time doesn't exist there. Time is just... George Carlin defined it, because we can't as scientists, so you need the poets and the comedians. <laughs> he said, time is nature's way of preventing everything from happening at once. <laughs> But you know, to a quantum physicist, that's not funny. <laughs> and you know why? Because everything is happening at once. <laughs> we just think it's not. <laughs> because we've organized ourselves outside of our abilities. And so, the stone has limited awareness. All right? Then we move up to the other kingdom called vegetables. And the vegetable kingdom has, you wouldn't say it has any awareness in it, it's just, but it's very different than a stone. It certainly has a lot more, a lot more uh, awareness than a stone. If you take one of your house plants and you put it over here in the shade and you've got a sunny part over here, something in the organizing intelligence of that plant says, move over this way. <laughs> and you'll find your plants stretching towards the sun. And you don't say to them, why are you so selfish? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Why aren't you happy with where you are? And try to make it feel guilty or try to make it feel bad. You accept it for what it is. You don't get mad at it. You don't punish it. You don't say, all right, if you do that, I'm going to put you in an even drier place, in an even darker place. I'll show you. You don't do that. So plants have awareness, much more so than a stone. Even though the physicalness of a plant and a stone are the same. And so is the physicalness of a plant the same as the hair or the skin on your head. <laughs> and a plant's limited awareness doesn't allow it, for example, to demonstrate being upset when you come along and pick its babies. You know, you take its little baby tomatoes away. It doesn't say, oh, my, I went through hours of child labor. How can you do this to me? And I've been shading these little tomatoes all this time, and now you're just going to take them and slice them up. And, you know, it just, it just, lets, just lets you do it. <laughs> Until you come up to the animal kingdom, which is the next level of, level of awareness. And in the animal kingdom, there's much, much more awareness than there is in the vegetable kingdom. I mean, you see animals caring for their young, and you see them migrating, and you see them swimming upstream, and you see them nesting and uh, looking for the right place, and finding mates, and taking care of their offspring. You see all kinds of, of new awareness in the animal kingdom. Most of it is just based on survival, on just sort of getting along, <laughs> on handling itself, isn't it? And then... There's the highest level of awareness. There's human beings. Animals? Yes. Same physical properties as a stone. And yet, within us, as all ages of man have said, is this organizing intelligence that allows us to go 
beyond our physicalness, our animalness, if you will. But we are led to believe a lie. And the lie that we're led to believe is that there are limits. You had them foisted upon you from the time you were very little. And it is only in recent years with uh, the understandings of quantum physics and quantum healing that there are no limits. And the evidence for it is what's going on in the world today. The fall of dictatorships, the presence of a, of a man who was imprisoned for his views just a few years ago, now being the president of Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel. Lech Walesa being the president elected of Poland when a few years ago he was incarcerated for his beliefs. The fall of the Berlin Wall. A woman in Nicaragua deciding to run against a dictator who had been there for nine years and winning that election, Violeta Chumura, disposing of a Daniel Ortega. The freeing of a Nelson Mandela all at once. All at once. All in the one song. All of these things happening as we almost become blasé about these events. And then last week in the elections in South Africa, when they were predicting horrible results, when the people were going to vote to continue apartheid, 77% of the people when they got behind that voting booth curtain in their own conscience, as the president, de Klerk, said, and he will become the Abraham Lincoln of South Africa. He said, the people of South Africa today transcended themselves and voted to end apartheid in South Africa. A step, a beginning step, but the consciousness the knowing, that powerful, invisible intelligence that is in every one of us can move mountains, can make miracles happen, can get you to a point where you can go beyond all of the limits that you thought were your inheritance when you showed up in this world of form. All of the things that you were told as a young boy or a young girl, that what you can and can't accomplish, what can and can't be healed, what can and can't be accumulated, what we can and can't do, how far we can go, how high we can jump, how much we can make, what we can... Ac All of these limitations we're beginning to discover at the quantum subatomic, sub-sub-subatomic level. There are no boundaries. And if there are no boundaries... then this physical world can become whatever we decide it's going to be because that's what the physical world is. When you get to the highest level of awareness, and the question then becomes, how do I access this invisible organizing intelligence? How do I make, how do I access it? How do I get a hold of it? This is how it works. For me, I know of no other way other than through meditation. Now, you can call it what you want. <laughs> you can call it meditation. You can call it prayer. You can call it chanting. You can call it, again, it doesn't make any difference. You can call it soccer. It isn't what you call it. But, as Blaise Pascal, the French scientist, said, all of man's troubles stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. <laughs> All you have to do is learn how to sit quietly in a room alone to access this highest level of pure awareness that is there. And when you access it, you begin to discover that you're not alone. Meditation, going within leaving the chatter level of your mind and going deep within, what it does is it shatters the illusion of your separateness. 
you begin to realize that you're connected. The connection is not physical. The connection is metaphysical. The connection is not in form. The connection is transform, beyond form. When you get that and you go to this level, first when you start this, you discover how slimy your mind really is. <laughs> And you find yourself thinking these endless thoughts and these endless thoughts and millions of them and they go on and on and on and you just sit there and you say, what, what is this? I'm not doing anything and I'm thinking and now I'm thinking about how stupid I am sitting here thinking and I'm, <laughs> nothing is happening. And, and you go through this, uh, this doubt. You see, doubt is the way most of us have learned almost all the things that we learn. We don't learn from knowing. <laughs> we don't learn from knowing. We learn from doubt. And so when you learn from doubt, at the quantum level, doubt affects what you are doubting. <laughs> doubt affects the observation of an object. The introduction of doubt in that observational process at the quantum level affects what you're observing. So if you can't get to knowing like you know you can still skate or you know you can swim or you know you can ride a bicycle, if you can't get to that level in spiritual awareness or higher consciousness or in manifesting abundance for yourself or in creating fulfillment for yourself or in healing yourself, if you can't get to the knowing level, then what you have, you're working on, is doubt. And if you maintain the doubt, the doubt itself will interfere because we're talking about now something that is not visible. It is invisible. It is beyond form. And doubt is right in there with it. So the doubt, the knowing, the surrendering, it's like when Deepak and I decided to do this together today. And whenever I come up on stage or when I write, I have this process that I go through I call, I call surrendering. And you just, you just get to a point where you know that you're not alone, that you have divine, invisible guidance available for you, and you go to this place, and you do all that you know how to do in the world of form, and then it's like this magical, it's almost like you put all of the worries and the doubts and the fears and the anxiety and the stress and the wondering, all of that stuff, you just put it in a balloon, <laughs> and you just... <sighs> You just blow it up and you tie it and then you let it go. And you watch all of that stuff go away and you say, I will allow the God within me, the invisible organizing intelligence that has organized me with a brain that is capable of remembering things that happened to me 20 years ago even though I had a different brain then. <laughs> I will allow that magnificent organizing intelligence that is somehow outside of my physicalness and inside it at the same time to take over. And whatever then comes my way, in the way of difficulties, in the way of problems, in the way of struggles, I will view, instead of as they shouldn't be happening, I will view as lessons as opportunities, as something for me to learn, as reminders of the spiritual being that I can become. I will not treat it as, why is this happening to me? Because I know now that my life is nothing more than a parenthesis in eternity. It started in a moment, it was born in a night, to perish in a night, when the soul slept in beams of light endlessly. And I trust that intelligence. I wonder how many of you know that in the world of highest awareness, nothing is impossible. In a tennis match that I was in not too long ago, on match point, a fellow on the other side hit a ball, it was in a doubles match, and he hit it to the corner. And I had decided to meditate my way through this match because we were having a tough time 
with this team. And I, we got behind, and, and all of a sudden I just... I went to this place where I got myself very centered and very focused and put my body in what they call an alpha state, and I began to just... with my breathing, and I just eliminated all ex- distractions, all external things at all, and I tried to just become the tennis ball. Not to hit it, but to be it. And I began to see the ball like like those balloons I described. I mean, I, I just couldn't miss anything. I was like, in this magical zone. And I stayed there for the longest time, maybe 35, 40 minutes, which is just an eternity to stay at this level in a competitive thing. And I had no connection to anything. I didn't know about the wind. I didn't know about the people who'd gather around watching the match. And he hit this ball, and it was match point for us. And he hit it, and it was a winner, for sure. I mean, he hit it over to the corner so hard, and I was here, and I took off. And I ran as fast as I could run, and I, the ball had hit here and was bouncing over that way, and I got to the ball, and I hit it back, just bare, and I got the ball back. Now, the other two opponents weren't watching. They figured it was an outright winner, and they were turning around then to continue the game. My partner and I started to walk off the court, and they said, wait a minute, he didn't get to that ball. That bounced twice. And everybody around said, no, no, he got to it. And they said to me, how did you do that? How could you possibly have gotten to that ball? You could never have gotten to that ball, not from where you were. And I said to them, I know you're going to find this hard to believe. (laughs) As I know you are. But the ball hit the ground, bounced up, and waited for me to get there. Now, it has never happened to me before. It's happened twice since. But it had never happened to me. And I play tennis almost every day. It had never happened to me, and I was as flabbergasted as they were. First of all, that I even took off for it, because it was in Hawaii, and it was very hot, and I was like, what am I doing this for? As I was going for that ball, I saw it sitting there. And I was so, I was the ball, I was so intent on that, that somehow my experience of that moment was that it waited. Now, for those of you who go, has he flipped out or what, what has happened or uh, whatever, I want you to know that that doubt, that doubt will keep you from ever experiencing such a thing in your life. Just the doubt. When you develop the knowing that, as Maharishi says, all things are possible at the unified field. All things excludes nothing. When you trust in yourself, you trust in the wisdom that created you. God bless you and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my best friends in the world, men I love dearly, Deepak Chopra. Really difficult to follow Wayne after that. <laughs> so I'd like to, in the little while we have, just say the same things that Wayne has said because there's nothing original for me to say, really. In fact, not only is there nothing for me to say that's original, or for Wayne, there is nothing original to say, because you know it all, as Wayne was implying, that that inner knowing that you have, you already know it. We are just illusions that you have manifested through your own desire, instantly, to remind yourself of something that you already know. We are perceptual artifacts. What really happens is that we get bogged down in that experience or the interpretation of the perceptual artifact. And in the last 200 years, even though Newton was a great scientist, his influence and that of Descartes, the French philosopher, has been so dominant in our culture that our whole culture 
and even our science has become bogged down in the superstition of materialism. That superstition of materialism says that sensory experience is the only crucial test of reality. What I can experience with my senses, what I can touch, taste, smell, see, hear, exists. That not only do my senses give me an idea of what's there, but they're extremely reliable. And we know even from common sense that that's not true. After all, sensory experience tells me that the earth is flat and nobody believes that anymore. Sensory experience tells me that the ground I'm standing on is stationary and I know it's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through outer space at thousands of miles an hour. Sensory experience tells me that this has a certain shape, size, texture, look to it, a color, perhaps a certain odor or fragrance to it. And that, too, is really a superstition. That's not the intrinsic nature of this reality. It's a response of the observer. It's a, it's a manifestation, as Wayne would say. It. It's a manifestation that our collective minds have created by itself. This is made out of the same stuff as you and I are made out of, or galaxies are made out of, or clusters of nebulas are made out of. This is a response of a certain observer with a certain set of perceptual apparatuses. The human eye, for example, can see only between 370 and 500 billionths of a meter. There's nothing sacred between 360 and 370. But for practical purposes, it doesn't exist for most of us. Take a walk with your dog and you'll see the dog hears sounds that you don't hear. Smells, fragrances and odors that are totally beyond your perceptual experience. What we experience as material reality is just a lens of perception giving us a very distorted and small and fragmented view of something that's much vaster, huger, abstract and ineffable. The material universe, despite its enormity, despite its hugeness, despite its solidity, despite its physicality, is nothing other than a stepchild of a much vaster, more abstract and ineffable reality. So the question is, what is the real nature of the world? What's it really like? Because what we are seeing and touching and hearing and tasting and smelling is a response of our perceptual apparatus. And the fault of the instrument should, no, should not really be a reflection on the user. The user, user is behind the instrument. And you'll find actually the user of the instrument is the same no matter what instrument is being used, whether it's the snail's nervous system or a human nervous system or anything else. The question is, what's the real nature of the world? Sir John Eccles, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, once made the statement. He said, I want you to know that there are no colors in the real world, that there are no fragrances in the real world, there are no textures in the real world, there's no beauty in the real world, and there's no ugliness in the real world. Out there, beyond our perceptual apparatus, is a radically ambiguous and ceaselessly flowing quantum soup. And in the, in the act of perception, we take that quantum soup, which is a field of infinite possibilities, all coexisting in an eternal continuum of the present, and we freeze that into the objects of material perception that are fixed in space and time. And when Wayne and I talk later about how in various states of consciousness, you can manifest anything you want, then we go into the exact mechanics of how that happens. But we're doing it all the time. We are like magicians. We are, we are real magicians all the time. We're like King Midas, who could never know the true texture 
of a rose or the soft caress of a kiss because everything he touched turned into gold. In the same way, in the very act of perception, we take this field of infinite possibilities, this huge, ineffable, abstract nothingness, and out of it we create material reality. The tragedy, of course, is that we keep doing it along very strict limitations between the boundaries of our own preconceived notions of how things should be as a result of our own indoctrination, which is a product of perhaps our culture or religion or dogma or ideology or belief. These are limitations. Belief is a limitation. It is belief and it is conceptualization, it is idea, it is dogma, it is ideology, it is thought that confines, that takes that eternal continuum and creates an idea out of it. And that idea is what manifests as a space-time event which we call first the mind and then the body. But we are neither. We are neither the body nor the mind. That's why the Rishi says, when I really found out who I was, I realized that I was not in this world, the world was in me. I'm not in the body, the body is in me. I'm not in the mind, the mind is in me. Body, mind and world just happen to me because I find it interesting. But in my true state, I know that I curve back within myself and I keep creating within myself, I curve back within myself and I keep creating again and again and again. And the miracle is not this world of manifestation, although it is in a sense. The miracle is that the God in embryo that is performing these miracles is inside of us. That in fact we are already doing it which reminds me of another conversation that I once heard a long time ago between, again, a rishi and his disciple. And at one point, the disciple turns to the rishi. He says, you know, you seem so enlightened, you must be able to perform miracles. And the rishi says, life is a miracle. Life is a miracle. I am beyond miracles. I'm completely normal. Life itself is a miracle. It says, the only problem with you is that you see the world in yourself and I see the whole world in myself. You see yourself in the world and I see the whole world in myself. It's a minor perceptual shift that you need to make between what is called object referral and self-referral. And we'll talk about that later perhaps in detail. But our whole current mythology of what and who we are is based on the superstition of materialism which says that I'm a physical machine that has learned how to think. And if I have thoughts and ideas and concepts and notions and ideology and dogma, if I fall in love or begin to dislike people or I believe in God or heaven or hell or salvation or damnation or communism or feminism, any of this. It's all because of the dance of molecules. Thought is an epiphenomenon produced by physical matter. Consciousness is the epiphenomenon of matter. Molecules move around and the dance of molecules somehow produces this epiphenomenon that we experience as thought. And our whole way of looking at human beings in terms of health or disease, etc., is all based in this whole idea that if this is a material body, then we can heal it only through materialistic means. And today I'm not going to go into the whole notion of how magic bullets came about, how our whole system is thoroughly confused in that it mistakes the mechanisms of disease for origins of disease, and even though we can effectively interfere with mechanisms of disease, unless we realize what the origins of disease are, we will never be able to ex have the experience of health. Mechanisms of disease can be very effectively intervened and interfered with, with drugs and surgery and pharmaceuticals, 
but they're only a temporary measure because mechanisms of disease are not the origins of disease or of health. Origins of disease and health have to do with understanding life itself, how life manifests through our physiology as process, not as molecules. The processes of eating, breathing, digesting, metabolizing, elimination, thought, sensory experience. We are the metabolic end products of our experiences. Because the body is nothing other than a printout of experience. And we, of course, think of experience as something external, something stimuli in the environment that impinge on our nervous system and somehow give us an experience, much like a tape recorder. You can press the button which says record, it'll record all the stimuli, and afterwards you can press the button which says play, and it'll play back the same stimuli. But if that were the case, then we would all be having the same experiences, given the same situation and same circumstance, same person or thing. We know even from common sense that's not so. Smell a fragrance and I can remember an old romance. Somebody else remembers, smells that same fragrance and gets nausea. <laughs> Somebody else smells that same fragrance and breaks out into a rash. Go see a movie and you walk out after two seconds and your best friend goes and sees it six times. It's the best thing they ever saw. And that is because an experience has nothing whatsoever to do with any external event. Whenever you're reacting to anything, whether it's a traffic jam or a love note or criticism from your boss or a sip of coffee or the rainy weather, you are reacting to a signal generated within the self to itself. The whole mechanics of creation of the entire universe is nothing other than the self interacting with its own self and experiencing its own self, now as the observer, now as the process of observation, and now as the observed. In reality, the observer, the process of observation, and the observed are all self-interactions experiencing themselves with different qualities of attention. The whole mechanics of creation is the self experiencing itself as different qualities of its own attention. And there's a very precise mechanics by which this happens very precise mechanics by which this happens. Once we understand that, then it becomes possible to realize that it is really possible to manifest anything in physical reality and there are relative degrees of ease with which we can do it. The human body is not just a lump of inert matter with consciousness as an epiphenomenon, the human body is a river of intelligence, of information and energy that's constantly and ever in dynamic exchange with the rest of this huge reservoir of intelligence, energy and information. And this dynamic change is going on in every second of our existence. Our physical bodies, as Wayne was saying, he was skating with his 1991 model, even the memory wasn't in that model at all. The memory is primordial to its physical expression. Current science says that all of the information which we have, which structures our body, is contained in the DNA. But that's wrong. The DNA is not the source of information, it's the expression of information. The information itself is in a much more abstract field. Just like when you read a book, when you read Wayne's book, you don't, the real magic is not in the ink. The ink is not the source of the book. It may be the means of transmitting the information. The information is in his consciousness. And the consciousness is not in matter at all. It expresses itself as matter. It conceives, governs, constructs, and becomes matter, but in itself it's not matter at all. And the human body is a river of intelligence and information, constantly in exchange with this huge other reservoir 
of intelligence, energy, and information. And you are changing your bodies more easily, more effortlessly, more spontaneously than you can change your clothes. Even the physical bodies that you're using to sit on these chairs aren't the ones that you walked in with a little while ago. You can take a number of physiological processes, just the simple act of breathing. With each breath that you inhale, you breathe in 10 to the power of 22 atoms from the universe. It's an astronomical amount of raw material that comes into your body, becomes your heart cells and kidney cells and brain cells and DNA and bone cells. With each breath that you breathe out, you're breathing out 10 to the power of 22 atoms that are coming from every little bit of your body. You're literally breathing out bits and pieces of your heart and kidney and brain tissue. And technically speaking, we are intimately sharing our organs with each other all the time. <laughs> Walt Whitman once said, every atom belonging to you as well belongs to me. And this is not a poetic metaphor, it's a fact of physiology. Because indeed, every atom belonging to you belongs to me. Here I go, staking my claim on things like pieces of property and mortgages and cars and bank accounts, when I can't even proclaim exclusivity over my physical body. In fact, based on radioactive isotope studies and mathematical computations, you can prove beyond a shadow of doubt that right this moment in your physical body you have a million atoms that were once in the body of Christ, or Moses, or Buddha, or Leonardo da Vinci, or Michelangelo, or Mr. Saddam Hussein, or Adolf Hitler. Think of anyone that's ever existed on this planet and you have raw material this moment in your physical body that was once in that body. In just the last three weeks, a quadrillion atoms have gone through your physical body that have gone through the body of every other living species on this planet. And you can do radioactive isotope studies and show beyond a shadow of doubt that in less than one year, you replace 98% of all the atoms in your physical body. That you make a new liver every six weeks, a new stomach lining every five days, a new skin once a month, a new skeleton. It seems so hard and solid and permanent, but you replace your skeleton once every three months. Even the brain cells that you think with as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, they didn't exist one year ago. And the DNA, which holds memories of millions of years of evolutionary time, the actual raw material comes and goes every six weeks. Like migratory birds. And in less than two years, you replace your entire body. You want to be a stickler about this and account for the last atom in every little bit of collagen and cartilage. In less than two years, you replace your entire body down to the last atom. So if you think you are your physical body, then at least from a scientific perspective, it's a bit of a dilemma, which one are you talking about? The 1992 model is not the same as the 1991 model. And here I am in Detroit with my 1992 model. And in fact, I did come here a couple of years ago. What's happened to that body that I brought with me two years ago? What has happened to that body? It's dead. It's gone. It's recycled earth, water and air. And so I don't need any further proof of the fact that I'm constantly outliving the physical death of my molecules. The molecules are just the carriers of who I am. I'm not my physical body. Perhaps my body is just the place that my memories call home for the time being. My skin cells change once a month, but they don't forget the difference between hot and cold. My stomach cells change every five days. They don't forget how to make hydrochloric acid. My taste buds change every six weeks. They don't forget the sweet taste of strawberry ice cream. My memories are constantly reincarnating as my physical molecules. 
the shelf life of my molecules is short, but the shelf life of my emotions is longer, the shelf life of my psychological makeup is even longer, but there's a part of me that has no shelf life at all, because it's in the timeless, it's in the continuum of immortality. And today again, scientists are able to prove this. A scientist whom I only met four or five days ago, and she's dying to meet you, Wayne, a scientist by the name of Candice Pert, who is, was the head of molecular biology at the National Institutes of Health, several years ago proved beyond a shadow of doubt that every time you have a thought, it becomes a molecule. That in fact, thinking is practicing not only brain chemistry, but body chemistry. And these thoughts, which we are constantly having, which are self-interactions in our own consciousness, are translating into precise messenger molecules coming from inner space, from that void of pure potentiality. And you can think of these messenger molecules as having receptors to them, and you can, the receptors have very precise, like little locks that fit into keys, there are receptors all over our body. That's how brain cells speak to each other. And there are receptors to these neuropeptides, not only in brain cells, but in all the cells of our body. So if you look at immune cells, for example, cells that protect you from infection and cancer and degenerative disorders, you'll find that immune cells have the same receptors. Your immune cells are constantly eavesdropping on your internal dialogue. Any thought you have, any feeling, any emotion, the immune cell is also experiencing that same feeling, thought and emotion. Not only do immune cells have receptors to these neuropeptides, as they were initially called, neuro because they were found in the brain, and peptides because they are protein-like molecules, not only do immune cells have the receptors, but they can make the same peptides that the brain makes when it thinks, the same proteins. So that is a really startling finding because it implies that immune cells are thinking cells. They may not be verbally as elite as the brain in that they don't speak in English, but if they use the same chemical codes that the brain makes when it thinks, then they're obviously thinking cells, they're conscious little beings. In fact, you ask a good neurobiologist the difference between the immune system and the nervous system and they'll tell you there isn't any. The immune system is a circulating nervous system. It's a thinking system. So if you're depressed, your immune cells are depressed. If you're jittery, they're jittery. If you're happy, they're happy. If you're exhilarated, they're exhilarated. And scientists today can in fact pin down the exact molecular messenger codes that are produced by these immune cells. For example, if you're jittery, then the immune cells produce adrenaline. They're jittery immune cells. If you're feeling exhilarated, they produce interleukins and interferons, which are powerful anti-cancer drugs, which if you had to go buy a full course of interleukin for the treatment of kidney cancer, for example, it could cost you $40,000. But conceivably, you could go on a joyride on Magic Mountain in Disney World, and you could make millions of dollars worth of interleukin too. If that's your idea, this is fun. Only the idea, only the idea. It's the idea that structures the molecule, and the idea is an interpretation of the self to itself. Because there is nothing other than the self. That's why, again, the Vedic Rishi says, I am that, you are that, all this is that, and that's all there is. <laughs> when you get to that level, then you realize that in fact, not only are you and I made of the same stuff, we are the same stuff, we are the same being interacting with its own self and experiencing itself through different qualities of its own attention to itself. That's all. And this body that we experience as a physical body is nothing other than a field of self-interactions generated in that field. It's nothing other than the field of self-interactions. This whole body is nothing other than a field of ideas. That's all it is. 
Therefore, the mind and the body are not two separate things. It's not that mind is here, the body is here. The body-mind are one, inseparably one, in every aspect of our physiology and, in fact, in every aspect of our cosmos. And it is not that the mind is in the body. It's the other way around. The body is in the mind and the mind is in something even much larger. We'll try and show that diagrammatically in a little while. The body is contained in the mind because the mind extends outside the body. So coming back to these messenger molecules that are not confined to the body, that extend outside the body, they're known as pheromones. And pheromones are communicator molecules, like the neuropeptides. If you infect that plant out there with a virus, then it will give off hormones into the atmosphere that let all the other plants know that there's an infection going around. So that plant is a localized concentration of awareness in a larger field of awareness that shares its awareness with other localized concentrations of awareness of a similar kind. Ants do that, termites do that. You see, it's perfectly orchestrated social behavior in termites, ants, and insects. A queen bee regulates the whole behavior of her colony because she knows what hormones to secrete. And those hormones then influence the behavior, the whole social behavior in that colony. And animals do it. There have been experiments in California and the USC where some scientists took some mice and gave them electrical shocks. And after a while, they remove the mice from the room and bring other mice into the room. As soon as these other mice enter the room, they panic because they've inhaled the hormones of fear. So now when you say, I went into this room and I felt the atmosphere was really tense, that's not a metaphor, but a fact of physiology. You say, I went to this holy shrine, this church, and I felt peace, love, and compassion. Not a metaphor, but a fact of physiology. Or when Wayne said that he was experiencing Jack's presence in this room, that's not really a metaphor. If you can go beyond the mirage of maya, you'll see that it's not a metaphor at all, but a fact of physiology. He said, I don't know what it is about this person, but he gives me the creeps. That's a fact of physiology. <laughs> I say, Emerson once said, who you are shouts so loudly in my ears that I cannot hear what you're saying. A fact of physiology. So it is the senses, through their own self-interaction, that break the continuum of eternity, eternal time, eternal space, into that space-time event. The space-time event is the thought, which then becomes the molecule. So you're used to the expression, everybody is familiar with the expression, first there was the word, and the word was made into flesh. Well, in modern terms, we can say first there was the quantum fluctuation and it was made in the, into the neuropeptide. <laughs> that neuropeptide, that quantum fluctuation, is a space-time event in a field which is beyond space and time. Einstein's definition of a field, he said, instead of being an actual model for space-time events, instead of being an actual model for space-time events, a field is the continuum of probability distributions for possible measurements as functions of time. Now, I know it sounds complicated, but bear with me for a minute and it will be very clear. A field is the continuum of probability distributions for possible functions of time. In other words, the field by itself is just pure potentiality. It is the continuum of all possible energy and information states that will subsequently manifest as space-time events. And this body is nothing other than a little flash in the pan of eternity. A space-time event, a quantum space-time event, and the mind is even a further cloud of space-time events. And we are not the space-time events. We are the ones that generate the space-time events, including time. 
Time is a frequency of self-interaction in that continuum of eternity. How I experience time varies or differs according to my state of consciousness. If I'm having a good time, time flies. If I feel that I'm running out of time, then all clocks move, move faster for me, and my biological clock f moves faster as well. People constantly use the expression, I'm running out of time. They literally have faster biological clocks. Their heart rates are faster, they have higher levels of growth hormone, glucagon, insulin, etc., and they suddenly drop dead of premature coronaries, they've run out of time. If your internal dialogue is, I have all the time in the world, then your biological clock mirrors that. Or if you're in love or having the experience of bliss, or if you're watching the stars perhaps, or one day you're listening to some music and it takes you into the timeless, as when you experience the following version of an expression, the beauty of the mountain was breathtaking, time stood still. Because in the timeless, what really happens is that the observer, the observed, the process of observation resolve into one unified wholeness of experience. Where the observer no longer feels experientially, knows himself or herself or itself as separate from that which is being observed. Because the fact is that that which is being observed is the observer. That which is being observed is the observer. And when we have that unified wholeness of experience, uh, peak experience as Abraham Maslow called it, or as the Vedic Rishis call it, the experience of unity consciousness, then when we are experientially grounded in that unity consciousness, then there is no difference between the observer and the observed, that knowledge which is really the experience of pure love also. It is the experience of pure love because in pure love you no longer feel separate from the beloved. You are the beloved. That's from where some of the greatest poetry comes. In one of his most memorable places, Tagore says, the same stream of life that runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measure runs through my veins night and day. It is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth into numberless blades of grass and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and death, in ebb and in flow. My limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life. And my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood this moment. When we experience that life throb of ages dancing in our blood, this moment, then we have the restoration of the memory of wholeness. This is the basis of Ayurveda. As is the atom, so is the universe. As is the microcosm, so is the macrocosm. As is the human body, so is the cosmic body. As is the human mind, so is the cosmic mind. It's easy to talk about the cosmic mind and the church of today. But in a scientific conference, so we usually don't call it that. We call it a non-local field of information with self-referral cybernetic feedback loops. <laughs> so as is the human mind, so is this non-local field. And if all is self-interaction, the immediate question is, who is having this self-interaction and where does it exist? And I want to spend just a little time on this. Because... I'm not the thought, I'm the thinker behind the thought. I'm not the doubt, I'm the doubter behind the doubt. And all these so-called aspirations that I have are in the field of space-time. I'm beyond the field of space-time. That's why again, the Rishi says, both anxiety and hope are born in the imagination. 
When, is one, when one is grounded in reality, one is free of both. Because why would you need hope if you didn't have anxiety? One implies the other, and they're both in space-time. I, me, is beyond space-time. Dr. Wilder Penfield, a very well-known neurosurgeon, credited with all this stuff we know today about the right brain and the left brain and motor cortex and sensory cortex, one of his most uh, well-quoted, well-recognized experiments is one in which he was uh, stimulating a certain part of the motor cortex and the patient's arms started going up like this. And he asked the patient, what's happening? And the patient said, my arm is moving up. And he said to the patient, are you moving your arm? The patient said, no, my arm is moving up. So he said, well, in that case, why don't you move your arm in the other direction? And the patient proceeded to do so. Now, no matter how hard you look, no matter what instruments you used, no matter what sophisticated technology you have, you'll never find with any instrument or any sophisticated gadgetry the location of the one who made the choice to move the arm from here to there. You'll find in the brain the location of that which executes the choice once it's made. Once the choice is made, then you'll find the location. So, for example, I ask you, choose between this and this. Choose this. I will not find in his body or in his brain that which made the choice this and not this. Once that choice is made, then I can find in the brain the location of that which executes the command. But where is the commander? Where is the commander? The commander is not in space-time. I will not find it in the body. The commander is choosing the body to execute those commands. It's not in the body. The body is in it. It's not in the mind, the mind is in it. It's not in the world, the whole world is contained in it. The choice maker, the commander, is nowhere and everywhere at the same time. That choice maker is nowhere, everywhere at the same time. And it's in the gap between our thoughts. It's in the gap between our thoughts. The gap is the quantum fluctuation. But where does that quantum fluctuation emerge from? From the void. And in that gap is hiding the commander. That gap between thoughts is the window. Thought, 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 thought. Right? Right now as I'm speaking to you, these are space-time quantum events in that unified field. So if I say, I'm going to take off my shoe, I can change that statement to say, I'm going to put on my shoe. Or I can change that statement to say, I'm going to make a phone call. I'm going to have ice, strawberry ice cream. I'm going to pay you a compliment. I'm going to take a flight to Italy. Between the going to and the next thought, is a little gap of silence, which is a field of infinite possibilities, infinite choices. That gap is my corridor, is the window, is the transformational vortex through which my individual self communicates with the cosmic self, which is non-local and everywhere at the same time. The cosmic mind is whispering to me in the silent gap between my thoughts. And me, my soul, my individual self, is the continuum of these gaps which are interrupted with my thoughts, which are space-time events. And even though this gap is a field of all possibilities, in that there are infinite choices in each gap, I hope you agree, infinite choices in each gap, yet each gap is qualitatively different from the other gap. This is the mechanics. Slip into the gap, have the desire, release the attachment to the outcome, 
and let the universe handle the details. It's handling them anyway, all the time. It's doing that. It's doing that all the time. It's doing that all the time. The earth is spinning on its own axis. It's hurtling through outer space. A human body is connected to that field of infinite correlation. Infinite correlation. Where everything is infinitely correlated with everything else. Any human body is that same field. A human body can think thoughts and play a piano and kill germs and eliminate toxins and digest food and monitor the movements of stars and make a new baby all at the same time. And not only do all these activities at the same time, it correlates all these activities with each other all the time. So that is the mechanics and higher states of consciousness are nothing other than your ability to go into that gap, because space-time are structured in that gap. Dr. Ellen Langer, a Harvard psychologist who has written a book called Mindfulness, talks about an experiment on aging that she did a few years ago when she advertised in the Boston Globe that she wanted a hundred people all over the age of 80 to participate in an experiment. And the experiment was that she took these hundred people to a little monastery outside of Boston and in that monastery she created an atmosphere, a sensory rich environment from the 1950s, late 1950s. She had Elvis Presley rock and roll music and Chevy Impalas parked outside, Walter Cronkite reading the news, except he seemed to have pimples on his face. And when he spoke, gave the news, it was about Nikita Khrushchev and Fidel Castro. When they watched movies, it was Alfred Hitchcock. Everything was created from the 50s, the fashions, the dresses, Life magazine, etc. And she said to them, be as you were in the 50s. Be as you were in the 50s. And after three weeks, she found that they had reversed their biological markers of aging. Not stopped them, but reversed them. Their visual thresholds changed. Their hearing thresholds changed. Their systolic blood pressure went down. Their skin became more elastic with more fat under the skin. Their wrinkles disappeared. Their bone density on x-ray changed with sophisticated techniques like bone densitometry. She did hormone levels, a hormone called dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate, which is an adrenal steroid that goes, it's a sex hormone that goes down as people age, but this started going up in these people. Everything that she measured in three weeks it had reversed. And not a little bit, but by several years. All she did was create an environment from 30 years ago and tell them, be as you were in the 50s. Don't reminisce, don't think of it as in the past, but be as you were. And just being as they were, that's what happened. She brought them back to Boston after a few days. They reverted exactly where they'd started from. So what we call everyday reality is nothing other than a socially programmed hypnosis. It's an induced fiction that we are help, we help participating in and creating. And if we can induce this kind of hypnotic trance and make it so real that it becomes real for us, then why can't we do it another way? So this afternoon when we start again, we'll be speaking together and I really feel a great privilege to be here in your presence, in the presence of Jack Poland and in the presence of Wayne and Marcy Dyer who have become really good friends of mine. And I'll end with a short quote from Franz Kafka to show you that this doesn't have to be a path of effort. The main thing is to bring about that carefreeness inside us because this is a carefree universe that is orchestrating itself by itself without any interference. And Franz Kafka, who usually wrote very depressing stuff, said in one of his most brilliant insights on the path to knowledge, he said, you need not do anything. Remain sitting at your table and listen. You need not even listen. 
just wait. And you need not even wait. Just become quiet and still and solitary. And the world will offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Thank you very much. When two extraordinary people sit down and talk to each other, the air becomes charged with a special kind of energy and excitement. Our program continues with just such a conversation. Let's now join Dr. Dyer and Dr. Chopra. Who's going to go first here? <laughs> this is actually um, something that we have uh, talked about doing in our private conversations, of which we have many, um, for a long time. And it's the very first time that we have ever uh, sort of dialogued together. One of my favorite uh, movies of all time was uh, My Dinner with Andre. If you haven't seen that, rent it. It's a... Uh, and it's just two people having a conversation for, uh, for the world to see. And that's sort of what we envisioned here. I had a thousand questions as uh, you were talking. And um, my first, the thing I, my first reaction to what you were doing is uh, we all talk about there's only, there's one, this unity, this oneness, and yet uh, in our lives that we live every day, we see separateness. You know, we drive different cars, we go home to different people, we have different families and so on. And I remember at our first lunch in Seattle that afternoon, we were talking about the mind-body connection. Somewhere in one of your books you said that, uh, what was it, 90% of the doctors do not believe, was it, in, in the mind-body connection? That, that was a survey done by the uh, American Medical Association short for AMA, which you might know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> the junk and, inside of this. <laughs> and they, they, once, they once did a survey of uh, doctors, and apparently 90% of doctors that they surveyed didn't believe in the mind-body connection. And um, recently I gave a lecture at one of the institutions in Boston, and I won't name it for now. <laughs> and um, uh, my brother's a faculty member of yeah. Harvard Medical School. And afterwards, <laughs> and afterwards uh, one of the other physicians went up to him and he said, uh, do you really believe all that <laughs> your brother does? <talks? laughs> Well, I thought, I thought the great question that you asked was uh, if 90% of the doctors do not believe in the uh, mind-body connection, you know, like, uh, how do they all wiggle their toes? Yeah, you know? so how, how do they wiggle their toes? Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's the question, you see. If, if the same God or intelligence or uh, infinite uh, intelligence, that organizing intelligence, runs through you, let's say, that runs through me, there's only one. There's not a different God for you and a different God for me and a different God for everyone. There's one in us. And I know that there's that, uh, that, that commander that you were talking about that I can't get a hold of is what allows me to wiggle my finger. Okay? I ask that question and I ask this of audiences. Uh, I know that there's, there's a thought and then there's a thinker of the thought and the thinker of the thought says, move your finger and I'm able to do that and yet I can never get a hold of what it is that allows that to happen. And if the same God that allows that to happen allows you to wiggle your finger, the question is, why can't I wiggle your finger? <laughs> the, reason, the reason you can't wiggle your finger is that you call me you. Mm -hmm. You think of me as somebody other than you, so exactly. you can't wiggle my finger. Okay. Because, despite what we are saying and we are doing here, you still think you're Wayne Dyer and I still mm -hmm. 
I'm Deepak, whereas we're both God pretending to be Wayne Dyer mm -hmm. and Deepak. <laughs> and that's how God plays his game, or her game, mm. hides herself to find herself. Mm. It's just a, a play, it's like playing Hamlet or anything else. You've got to make the play interesting. Mm. So it has to have a sinner and a saint and a victim and, and a hero. And basically the sinner and the saint are merely exchanging notes, they're both God. Mm. The saint has sinned and the sinner shall be sanctified. But it makes the play interesting, mm. that's why. It's, what, what I suggest and what I think about is what we're conditioned to from the time that we are born and the time we come into form is to believe in our separateness. I mean, that's, that's really what all of the conditioning and education is about. You are you and, and somehow you are distinct from me. Meditation, transcendental meditation that you practice, meditation going within, shatters that illusion. It shatters it slowly. I mean, mm. every time you break a boundary here and there. And the analogy is frequently given that it's like dipping a cloth into some, into a dye. Let's say you have a white turban and you want to make it red or orange. You take it and you put it in this dye and then you take it out and then a little bit of the color is there. Mm -hmm. and you put it out in the sun and it'll fade away. But a faint hue, a tinge will remain. Mm. Then you take it again, break a few more boundaries, put it back, and you keep doing it till one day it's there forever. Mm. And you can put it in the sun, you can put it anywhere, and now that can't be overshadowed. Yeah. So every time you contact the self, which is beyond the self-image, then the, a little bit, a glimpse into eternity, a glimpse into immortality. You keep doing it and doing it and doing it till ultimately you carry the consciousness of eternity no matter where you go. Is there a place where I will be able to go within and wiggle your finger? Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a measure of the degree to which you access the gap. Can I sure. uh, elaborate on this a yeah. minute? Let me t first of all tell you about uh, a patient that I had two years ago because I got a real good uh, glimpse of this with him. You've heard this story before and I'm sure some other people who've r perhaps read my book have heard it. Uh, Bob's 28 years old and he was repairing an antenna one day and he touched a wire that he thought was dead but in fact it was a live wire that had uh, 20,000, 12,000 volts of electricity in it. So as soon as he touched it, he died. And the mechanism of death is that the current goes through your body and creates ventricular fibrillation, the heart stops. And as it happened, he fell from the roof and fell to the floor, and he happened to fall on his chest with the exact location, precise angle, precise impact, to start another electrical current, to defibrillate him. So when I asked him, what happened to you, Bob? He said, uh, God called me, and then he quickly changed his mind. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, that's exactly what happened. We asked him, what happened to you? And he says, this was bliss, it was ecstasy, it was pure joy. And I asked him, uh, that means you were aware? And he said, yes, I was aware. I've never been so aware in my life. I said, were you aware of anything in particular? He said, no, nothing in particular, but everything in general. Mm. So what he was describing was a non-local spiritual experience of being everywhere in space-time, an mm. omnipresence, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence of being everywhere. That is, he not only slipped into the gap, but he went out here and he could experience his immortal spirit everywhere in space and time. Now as it turned out, his leg had burned as the current came out from his leg and it was hurting him a lot and there was a lot of burning mm. and pain. And then he said he would think of this gift from God that he had received. The gift not of life because he realized that this is life and this is just an experience. Mm. And it wasn't the gift of life, it was the gift of knowledge of his own immortality. And he was filled with gratitude and 
he was so filled with gratitude that every time he would think of the gift, he would go into the gap and then slip into that field. Mm. And then, like a true scientist, he started experimenting. He started going to the field and at the same time putting his attention on the leg, which had burnt and was hurting but would now start tingling with a kind of a pleasurable sensation. Well, to make a long story short, over the course of a year, he healed his burnt leg, he grew new muscle fibers, he has a new leg. In fact, I just heard from him two, three weeks ago. He's a friend of mine, obviously now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he went skiing uh, three weeks ago. What did he do? Well, he went to the same place from where nature creates everything, whether it's a galaxy or a cluster of nebulas or a rainforest or a leg or a thought. Mm. And then what he also did was he developed the ability to maintain the simultaneity of non-local non -local awareness and local awareness at the same time. Now, when we meditate, when we break our boundaries, we dip into the gap now and then. Mm. But if we get to a stage where we can experience that and waking, dreaming and sleeping, that experience, that simultaneity of transcendental consciousness along with waking, dreaming and sleeping, it's you're asleep, but there's a part of you that's fully awake. Or you're dreaming and there's a part of you that's watching the dream. Or right now, we are in waking state of consciousness, but there's a part of me in eternity. Or you're listening to me, your awareness is localized to me, but who's listening? Who's listening? And where is that one that's listening? Turn your attention right now to the one who's listening. And that's non-local, it's everywhere. That simultaneity of local and non-local awareness, which means an all-knowingness of everything in general and all things in particular at the same time, is called cosmic consciousness. And when we refine that a little bit, in that when I see this, and I see it in terms of its local value, which is as a localized concentration mm -hmm. of that same infinite being, and in its universal value, then that's God consciousness. Because I see God in everything that I comprehend. And the, beyond that is unity where mm -hmm. there's no difference. The things that, the miracles that you hear of people manifesting, uh, Christ uh, raising the dead, uh, the, Sai Baba. Uh, the Sai Baba manifesting uh, artifacts out of, uh, out of apparently nothingness. Are you saying that all of us have that uh, within yes, us? Yes, we all have it and it's dependent on the quality of our attention, because basically we are our attention. If our attention is only on the local, then that's all we see. Right this moment, most people in this room will take in less than one billionth of the stimuli that are present in this room. Mm. Less than one billionth of what's here right now will get into the nervous system of most people. And what gets in is that which reinforces their notion of what they think that is there, your phrase, your famous phrase. You'll see, you'll see it when you believe it. So they have the notion first, right. and then they see it. The nervous system otherwise edits it out. Mm. The more I break down my conceptual boundaries, because what I see is only my conceptual boundaries, the more I break them down, then more access I have to the field of pure potentiality from where I'm manifesting everything. So there are levels of degrees of ease with which we can manifest things. Your, you know, that example that you were... Yeah, the, what I think of when I think about all these people watching is um, so many of them think that that's something that other people can do who are gifted and who are specially enlightened and who have uh, special connections to God. But in fact, when you begin to meditate, or when you go within and discover that higher part of yourself, you soon discover that those things that we call synchronicity, or that those things that we call miracles, are very much a part of our life. And after a while, you begin to see yourself doing things and knowing things that uh, you thought were impossible before. <clears throat> and you, and when, when you talk about Maharishi, who I know you're so close to, um, some of the things that he has directed you to do from his awareness and how they got manifested in the world. I mean, remember the story you told me about uh, the Air India flight and the... Uh, can you talk about that here? Is that, sure. Do you want yeah. me to? Sure, I do. Yeah. It blew me away. I, I've, never, <laughs> I've never told these stories in public, by the way. That's why I'm, I got you up here. <laughs>
Uh, this is about five, six years ago, and I was in Washington, and I'd met with the FDA about various things that we were doing with uh, herbal medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. And that evening, I happened to speak on the phone with Maharishi. And he knew that I was going to India to see my mother, who wasn't feeling well. And he got me on the phone, and he was somewhere, uh, I don't know where he was, non-local somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, but he is, he is real magic in action, isn't he? I mean, he's... Uh, yeah, he, all of us are. Yeah, but he's at this level yeah, that... Yeah, uh, definitely. So, you know, he asked me where I was going. I said I was going to India. And he said, well, if you're going to India, then you should meet the president and the vice president and the prime minister and the speaker of the house and you should tell them all the stuff about Ayurvedic medicine. And while he's speaking to me on the phone, I'm saying to myself, how does he expect me to get an appointment with the president? You know, you just don't go and knock on the door of the president of India and say, you know, I want to talk to you about Ayurvedic medicine. Well, as it turned out, he kept me on the phone so long that I missed my flight. And I had to take another flight to uh, LaGuardia and then switch to JFK. And I had an economy seat and they had given it away because the, I was late. And then they felt sorry for me because I looked so tired and exhausted. And they put me in a first class uh, seat and I was sitting next to this Indian man who was having a cognac every 15 minutes as if it was <laughs> doctor's orders. <laughs> and. Uh, by the time we got to England, he was really sloshed. <laughs> and, and when we took the flight off uh, from England, he looked at me and he said, uh, you don't like cognac? And I said, you know, because I'm making my own. <laughs> and, and he said, how do you do it? <laughs> and I said, God, you know, this fellow is drunk. I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> But he kept after me, so I started telling him about my own experiences with meditation and Ayurveda. And I talked nonstop from London to Kuwait. <laughs> I spoke nonstop. And when we left Kuwait and we were finally coming down in Delhi, he looks at me and he says, Oh, by the way, would you like to meet the president, the vice president, the prime minister, and the speaker of the house? Mm. I said, who are you? <laughs> and who sent you here? He said, oh, nothing. They, they had this Bhopal tragedy there those days. And, you know, he was going to India with a check for five million or three million dollars as, as part of a relief fund. And he had these meetings for him. And he said, but I don't know what to tell them. And now we can tell them this stuff and we'll go around all this stuff. <laughs> So that's, that's the field of infinite correlation. When you slip into the gap, have the desire, yeah. release your attachment. When uh, Maharishi said to you, um, meet the president, and you had the doubt, what, the, what was his response? I said, you how am I going to meet these How people? am I going to meet them? And he said, you'll meet them. And then when I finished, I had met mm -hmm. them, I called him all excited to tell mm -hmm. him I'd met them. And he wasn't interested in listening to the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, one other story like that, because this place in Lancaster, which is Ayurveda in practice, which if you it's ever... It's like he's my PR agent. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Marcy and I are going, along with Luis uh, Hay, who is sponsoring a lot of our talks together around the country, uh, again in May, and it's just a magnificent, healing, beautiful place. But um, I, wasn't it Maharishi who said, uh, uh, get a place in Massachusetts, get yourself 100 acres and get your... And, uh, yeah, that's another story. I was in New York. Uh, again, I've told you all these stories. I haven't ever... But it's, it's, it's so phenomenal because I, want to, I think we can lead into something with these stories. Well, I was in New York magic. City and I met some stockbroker who had, was the stockbroker for a certain film star who was there and I happened to see her and uh, that day a lot of interest was generated suddenly in Ayurveda, especially the rejuvenation aspects of Ayurveda, a lot of interest. Mm. And I said to myself, you know, I have all this stuff to talk about, but there's no place. We don't have a place. So that evening, I called Maharshi and I spoke to him and I said, you know, 
Ayurveda is becoming very popular, but there isn't a place. <laughs> I said, I think there's a retreat somewhere near where you live. Don't you live in Massachusetts? I said, yes. He said, well, in 1958, I remember, this is now, we're talking about 35 years mm -hmm. later, there's a retreat somewhere near you, and you should go and see it. It would be really good. So I went there that night, and there were no lights, there were no heating in this place. Mm. And um, because it was a con it used to be a convent which had been sold to the TM people mm -hmm. who had then sort of just used it as a retreat and they weren't doing much with it. Heating bills weren't being paid and lights weren't on and so on. And I went there and the building was kind of run down but it had 150 acres of land around mm. it which we found out accidentally was part of the property. We didn't even know that. Mm. <laughs> so we sold about 10, 15 acres of the land. We still have 130 left. With that, we raised a few million dollars and refurbished the whole thing, and now we have this facility yeah. out of the blue. <laughs> Those uh, people who know, people who know and have that knowing are able to treat it almost like childlike. My favorite story you ever told of Maharishi, because we, we think that you have to somehow become this adult and you have to be uh, very mature. And, and you all talk about how childlike uh, and almost infantile uh, holy people or people who, they don't lose that child within them. And there was, you were having a meeting, was it in Belgium or something? And you remember that? It was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> They brought in candy. Do you remember the... Uh, yeah, yeah. And he acted like this little tiny child. He said, candy, you brought, you, you brought me candy. I mean, it, he went from perhaps one of the most brilliant people alive to this tiny little child who stopped this meeting, you were meeting on transforming the world or something, <laughs> and, and then just enjoyed his candy so that it's like, this is something that's in every one of us. It's the two aspects of childlike nature that... Um, holy men have, mm. it's not childishness. Childishness is very different from being childlike. It's play and fantasy. Mm. Fantasize anything you want. Inherent in the fantasy is its materialization. Because you don't have the same fantasies that I have. So that non-local field of information is expressing itself localizing itself as your fantasies. I don't have those fantasies, I have other fantasies. But inherent in the fantasy is the whole mechanics of evolution of the materialization of that fantasy. That's one thing. And the other is playfulness, which means don't take life seriously. Don't take yourself seriously because it's a recreational universe. Mm. The reasons why dolphins dance and cavert over the oceans, the reasons why stars sparkle at night, and the reasons why children play, and the reason why trees re reach out to the sun, is that this is a playful recreational universe. And therefore, that the more we have that playfulness inside us, it's a play. The Vedic word for that is leela. Hmm. Leela means play, divine play. God is playing a game of hide and seek, hiding herself to find herself. Who was the little girl who could who could hear the who could hear the uh, the whales or the? Yeah, that's another story told to me by an English anthropologist, Irish anthropologist. He was looking for a certain um, species of whale to to write about in his book. And he was traveling the South Seas, and um, he'd had a tough time spotting this particular whale. And one day he mentioned it to the, one of the village elders who said, there's a girl here who's 13 years old, and she can fetch the whale for you. Hmm. So he met her, and they were sitting on the beach. And they closed her eyes. She closed her eyes. He says about 20 minutes or so later, he f started feeling his heart was pounding because he saw over the horizon this big, huge whale. And then it came nearer and nearer and nearer, and finally it beached itself 
and uh, at the feet of this girl and they had to get the whole village out to put the whale back into the ocean. Afterwards he went to this girl and he said, what did you do? And she said, it was very simple. I went to that place where we all speak the same language and then I asked it to come, that's all. So next day, uh, Dr. Watson was going fishing and he took the girl with him. <laughs> and <laughs> every few minutes she would put her head in the ocean, she'd say, let's go ten miles this way. They'd go there and find what they were looking for, then she'd put her head in the ocean. Let's go seven miles this way and they'd find what they were looking for. So finally he couldn't resist it anymore. He put his head in the ocean, kept it there till he couldn't breathe anymore and then took it out and looked at this girl and said, I couldn't hear anything. And she said, that's the trick, <laughs> to hear the silence. It is the trick because otherwise our internal dialogue is so noisy that it interferes with this transformational vortex, this corridor, this window that we have to the cosmic mind. So it's not important to have a positive idea, positive mind. You know, we hear so much about positive thinking. You've got to have a positive mind. And that's not what we're talking about because a positive mind can be a very stressful mind. I have patients who are exasperatingly positive all the time. <laughs> so much that they make me nervous. <laughs> They make about you nervous? I want to talk. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> because positive mind, although it's better than a negative mind, it's still a turbulent mind. It's positive thoughts all the time. What we want is a quiet mind. And when the mind is silent, then one becomes a witness of both the positive and the negative. And one realizes that both the positive and the negative are aspects of the same thing. They are poles of opposites that make for a meaningful co life. If there weren't villains, there wouldn't be any need for heroes. If there wasn't heart, there wouldn't be any cold. The whole universe is the lively coexistence of extreme opposites. And we have to quietly, somewhere deep inside us, reconcile ourselves quietly to that coexistence. And then we are at peace then we don't say this is good, this is bad, we lose the need to judge. We lose the need to judge, we relinquish the need to say this is right and this is wrong, this is good and this is bad. This is... The two are necessarily aspects of the same God. God is the villain, God is the hero, God is the, the victim, the vanquished and the conqueror and everything. So once we get to that level, we just lose that need. And when you lose that need to judge, there's a nice prayer, it comes from the Course in Miracles. Today I shall judge nothing that occurs, for non-judgment creates silence in my mind. When I relinquish that need to just let go, because it's lively and it's wonderful and it's blissful, because of the negativity and the positivity. If it was, there's another saying in Veda, a man who is born blind will never know the meaning of darkness. In order to know the meaning of darkness, you have to see light. So the two go together and when I lose my need there, then I can experience bliss. Because bliss is not happiness. Happiness is always for a reason. It's a thought, a positive thought. I'm happy because you paid me a compliment or I'm happy because I made a lot of money or I'm happy because um, whatever, I won the lottery. But when I'm happy for no reason whatsoever, then I'm in bliss. And that comes from going beyond the poles of opposites. You know, Joseph Campbell did a whole program, a whole series of, uh, I don't know, did you ever meet him? Before? Yeah, a little did bit, you? I yeah. loved him. Yeah. And uh, pursuing your bliss. I've often felt as I talk to salespeople and business people around the world that uh, so many of them are looking to set goals and to find out the way to make money and to get, get the things that they want for themselves. And I always think about bliss as uh, what you have to do first is fall in love with what you do. And then what you sell is that love. 
you don't sell what you do, you don't sell your product, you don't, you, you transform yourself as someone who's out there uh, giving away bliss. And many of you have, have heard me talk over the years about the orange. When you squeeze an orange, what comes out is, is orange juice, because that's what's inside. And the same metaphor expands. It doesn't matter what time of day you squeeze it, it doesn't matter what instrument you use, it doesn't matter what the, what the circumstances are. When you squeeze an orange, you get what's inside. Well, when, when someone squeezes you, <laughs> and out of you comes anger, or frustration, or bitterness, or non-bliss, it really isn't because of who did the squeezing. As much as we like to convince ourselves that that's what's causing us to have non-bliss, uh, it's because that's what's inside. And how that gets inside, I always, I, I use the thing as if, as if this were my uh, car key, and I'm in my house, and I were to, uh, and it's dark in the house, and I were to drop my key, and I look around for a while, and I say, well, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to look in here. <laughs> it's dark. But I notice that outside, there's a street light, so I go out under the street light, and I'm out here, and I'm looking for my key. <laughs> And a friend of mine comes along and says, Wayne, what happened? I said, well, I dropped my key and I can't find it. And he said, well, I'll help you find it. And we looked for a half an hour and finally he says to me, well, where did you drop it? I said, well, I dropped it in the house, but there's, there's, uh, there's no light in there, so I came out here to look under. He said, well, you mean to tell me you dropped your key in there, but you're looking for it out here? I said, well, yeah, because the light is here. Now, does that make as much sense? But isn't that what we do when we have a problem that is in here and we look for the solution out there, when we're looking for the answer in a place, the answer has to be where the problem is. And if, if bliss is in here because of the way you have chosen, is that how you have chosen to process the world, then that's all you'll have to give away. And when the stuff, the negative stuff comes into your life, as it will, at least I found that it will, I mean, it's, it's hills and valleys, it's, uh, it's about getting annihilated. <laughs> And uh, then thinking that you got it made and then another annihilation comes along and how you deal with that and how you grow from that. But if you believe that your, your inner world is the result of what other people are saying or doing, what I think you have to do is an inner candle flame, you know, that never flickers, though the worst goes before you. I don't pretend to be able to do that at all times, but I'm a lot better at it than I used to be. Yeah, and it, the thing to remember is it's okay to have all the negativity. It's mm. okay to feel angry and it's okay to feel negative, but to realize that that's part of a spectrum and that there is other parts of the scenery. They're both there and we reconcile ourselves to their coexistence. That's the important thing. The, and the universe is always sending out two messages, always. You don't have to really even be intellectual about this. There's one message that is inside the body. It's a message of comfort. And there's another message inside the body. That's one of discomfort. These are the only two messages we get. And you don't have to be intellectual, as I said. Just tune into your physical body. Spirituality is an extremely sensual experience. Mm. And there's another, this is a different um, idea than most people have. They separate the senses from, and sensuality from spirituality, from consciousness. But if the body is the product of that consciousness, then to be grounded in the body, in your own sensuality even, is to be grounded in the present, in the presence of God. And to therefore structure your behavior in such a way that it amplifies the bliss. As mm. Campbell said, follow the bliss, amplify the signal of comfort in your physical body and do things that do not give you the experience of discomfort in your physical body and you're on the path to spirituality. When you were talking this morning, you said, you mentioned uh, not only is it uh, stranger than we think, it's stranger than we can think, <clears throat> and that it's a thinking universe. In fact, you mentioned the other day that someday you'd like to write something like that, that it's a thinking universe. One thing that you did with, uh, with me one time was to talk about the thinking body. Mm -hmm. That most of, us, most of us really and truly do think that our thinking takes place in the brain and that's, all, and that's where thought originates and that somehow that is, and that the rest of the body doesn't think. But let's use an example, like right now, 
As a matter of fact, it's under the lights and everything, and I'm thirsty, okay? What's going on in my body? I mean, to, to prove that the, the mm -hmm. body is thinking all over the place. So as soon as you have that idea, I am thirsty, as soon as you have that idea, that I'm thirsty, then your brain, your cortex, it makes a, a peptide, a protein called angiotensin II. And that angiotensin II, it influences your behavior in such a way that you start looking for water. Which is what you I'm going to do while you're talking. Start looking for water. <laughs> At the same time, there's another part of your brain called the hypothalamus, and that also secretes angiotensin II. That makes the hypothalamus secrete a hormone called ADH, antidiuretic hormone, that makes your body hold on to water. At the same time, your kidneys make angiotensin II, so you don't lose it in the urine, you hold on to it. At the same time, your skin cells make angiotensin II, so you don't sweat as much, you hold on to the water in the skin. Your lungs make it, so the lungs start saying to themselves, I need water. You don't lose water in the breath. Your heart cells make it. In other words, as soon as you had the idea, I want water, it was simultaneously everywhere in all the cells of your body at the same time. It didn't first occur here in English or Swahili. It occurred everywhere at the same time. So it was omnipresent. And the scientific term for this is thinking, therefore, is a non-local phenomenon. Even though we think it's local, it's localized to the brain, it's not. Because the mind isn't in the brain. The mind is expressing itself as the body, which is a space-time event everywhere, all at the same time. In other words, every thought is omniscient, it's omnipresent, it's omnipotent. Now, where was that thought, I am thirsty or I want water, before you had it? Where was it? It was a probability amplitude in the gap. And where was it before that? Everywhere and nowhere at the same time just a pure field potentiality. Then when that field began to interact, it became a probability amplitude, which is the wave, and in the frozen moment of attention, it became the particle, which is the material form. But the material form, which is that which ultimately expresses itself as material reality, the wave and the field are all the same thing. They're just some <coughs> different manifestations. So that every part of my body is thinking all the time. All the time. Now, and can my body, let's say I'm, uh, I'm feeling tense and I need a Valium. Can my body... Say that? I'm feeling tense and I want to have a, vol a, a Valium or I want to have uh, some kind of tranquilizer or whatever. Can my body, am I capable, if I learn how to get to this higher place which we're going to get to, and manufacture that for myself without yes. having to go to the drugstore. At a deep level of awareness, if you have this notion, and it's a notion, it's just a notion, it's just an idea, that I'm having the experience of tranquility, then your body will indeed make Valium. The only thing is, it won't make it in such doses that you'll feel like a zombie. Mm. It'll make it in the precise dose that's necessary to allow your cells to do the job in tranquility. When you're feeling jittery, then your body will make jittery molecules like adrenaline, and it won't make it just from the adrenal gland. It makes little platelets will make ad adrenaline. These are frightened platelets that are huddling together because they're scared. Mm. If you're feeling... That's they laugh, but that's true, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that truly that's is how the on. clotting yeah. cascade yeah. starts. And if you're feeling exhilarated, then as I said earlier, you're making interleukins and interferons, which are and very powerful anti-cancer drugs. Now, I go on a joyride, let's say on Magic Mountain, and I make interleukins, but somebody else goes and they don't. They make adrenaline. It's not the joyride. Mm. It's my interpretation of the joyride. Now, it's easy to say, therefore change your interpretation, but realize that our interpretations are also products of our childhood and our cultural indoctrination, what our parents told us, what religion tells us, what belief in dogma and ideology of our mm. society tells us. So even though we say change it, it's not like you can do it instantly. But one thing you can do is begin to have the insight that it's interactions. One thing I tell some patients of mine is look around you and look at the universe as if it was 360 degrees of mirrors. So every situation in the environment 
is me cre interacting with myself and experiencing it as this situation, this person, this thing. So everything, in, I'm looking at the 360 degrees of mirrors where I'm seeing myself expressing as all this diversity. And now I say, if this is not a pleasant message that I'm getting, then what am I doing that I should change? It's not wrong. It's just, you know, there's no right and wrong. Let's get that straight. There's no right and wrong. There's no evil and there's good. It's just not so pleasant, that's all. And I prefer to the pleasant to the unpleasant. I choose my behaviors in such a way that I amplify the signal of comfort. Three things that I tell my patients sometimes if they have serious illness, three simple things to do. One, meditate regularly, every day. It gives you access to the gap and the silence. Two, for a while just be silent. We take a patient and put him in two weeks, three weeks of silence. Maharshi went into silence for 13 years in a cave. We don't have to do that, don't worry. And Did you say 13 Years? Thirteen years, he was in silence. And his teacher, Guru Dev, was in silence for forty years in the forest. When they finally went to get him, in the, you know, because they had, they had a, the president of India wanted to honor him for something, and they, he, was, he was the next uh, in line for a certain post, spiritual post. Even spiritual people have politics. And <laughs> he was... The, in the line for that, and they went to get him in the forest. He'd been in silence for 40 years, and he's, he was, they said the tigers would come by and sit next to him, and snakes had wrapped themselves around his legs, and birds would light on his hand, and somebody said, you know, Gurudev, all these snakes, poisonous snakes and cobras around you. He said, what do you mean, cobras and poisonous snakes? All I see is God. He could just experience that, and therefore, when he was so firmly established in nonviolence, as a Vedic Sutra, when we are firmly established in nonviolence, then all beings around us cease to feel hostility. They become incapable of experiencing it in our presence. And he was so far, so he was 40 years in silence. Well, I tell my patients, let's do two weeks. And if you can't do two weeks, let's do one week. And if you can't do one week, let's do one day at a time. Just wear a little button over here, I'm in silence. And when people go into silence, then mind becomes very turbulent in the beginning. Because you have all these things you need to say. One fellow came to me and he said, if I don't call my girlfriend and tell, wish her happy birthday, I'll die. So I said, well, make that call and then we'll go into silence. <laughs> uh, so you ha that's the second thing, meditation, going into silence. And third, very important, get away from the need to define or label or describe or interpret or analyze or evaluate. In other words, lose the need, relinquish the need to judge. When you stop judging, everything falls into place. Mm. That's good advice. It really is. I remember in reading uh, Return of the Rishi, your, was that your first? That was the first? Second. Second. You talked about being a little boy in a village in India, and this guy came through, and uh, they buried him. I think the t name of the chapter is Today We Buried a Saint. Tell him, I mean, that just fascinates me, that, uh, that, that a human being can train themselves to do this. I love this. This is in your book. Don't tell me this is a secret. Yeah, this guy's no, got more secrets. He said, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't tell anyone. And before you, then he's on Geraldo talking about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, uh, you know, my mother is very fond of visiting spiritual people. And my mother is an extremely spiritual person, in fact. A few years ago, she went to a cave in the Himalayas, and uh, uh, the legend is that if God wants to manifest himself in that cave, then Shiva manifests as a rearing cobra about six inches in front of you with its fangs open. And any other person would be petrified of that experience. When she went into that cave, she meditated there for a few hours, and then this cobra appeared and came down, this big Shiva lingam slithered down, came right to where she was and stood right six inches in front of her like this with its fangs open. And she had tears in her eyes because she, she knew that she had manifested God. Wow. <laughs> and, and then, of course, the cobra slithered away. But
But we have, we had a neighbor who was a Swami and every few months, every few, once in a while, every few seasons, he would go into Samadhi, the experience of silence, go into meditation, close his eyes, and then he would be in that for a week, ten days, two weeks, sitting in one place. And uh, his metabolic rate would slow down to zero. Because when thought comes to a standstill, and you're in that gap, then everything comes to a standstill, time comes to a standstill. No thinking, and yet an awareness. But I wasn't sophisticated enough to understand that. I was a medical student, I went to him, I said, Swamiji, when, you're, when your heart rate is, when you don't have a heartbeat, and your oxygen consumption is zero, and your basal metabolic rate is zero, then that's death. He said, no, my son, that's the experience of immortality. <laughs> because it's not an extinction, it's an alive awareness in which all time, all knowledge coexists in, in a continuum, this past, present, future. It's a huge screen of consciousness. And the Vedic expression is, when I'm grounded in this screen of consciousness, then I notice that infinite worlds come and go on the vast expanse of my consciousness, like motes of dust in a beam of light that's shining through the roof. And then I realized that this is just another little, another little event in space-time. Which doesn't mean that I, I lose my interest in this, or I don't enjoy it anymore. In fact, I enjoy it much more, because behind me there is the security that when this is over, it's not the end. It's just... Act 5, scene 5 of this particular drama. And when I'm not so, so involved in the drama that I forget who I am, that the, I'm the actor and not the character that's in the play, then the one thing that happens is that the hysteria goes. You lose the hysteria. And that is enough. As long as life ceases to be hysterical, that's the beginning, you know, because most people's lives are so hysterical. It's just one hysterical scene followed by another. Mm. <laughs> Marianne Williamson, in her new book, uh, Return to Love, which is really wonderful, I think, has a, w a great quote in there. She said uh, there's, you know, that there's purpose to all of this, and God's, God's plan works, and yours doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so get yourself in tune with God's plan. But tell them about how they buried that saint in your village. I want them to tell you that. <laughs> Well, this, that, that just blew me away. When <laughs> I was a third-year medical student, and we had this uh, saint who came from the Himalayas, and we persuaded him that we would be able to experiment with him. And we put him in a coffin, and we dug a hole six feet into the ground and put him there and covered the ground with the dust. And six days later, we dug him out. And uh, as we opened the coffin, very slowly you start seeing, he was hooked on to EEGs and heart um, EKGs and so on. And during this period, there was absolutely no electrical activity of his heart. And after six days, when he came out, his heart started to flicker just a bit, a bit, a bit, and then he slowly opened his eyes. He said, uh, could I have a glass of milk, please? <laughs> after six days. He went into the transcendental state of consciousness and maintained it there for six days. And uh, see, aging occurs not in the gap, but in the space-time events. Aging occurs in these space-time events. In the gap is where time is manufactured. Time is manufactured in the gap here. So, I'll give you an example of how we manufacture time. I read this case report from Germany recently where seven miners were trapped in a mine. And all of them had a watch except uh, for one person. And he didn't want the others to get scared in order to allay their anxieties. Every time two hours went by, he would call out one hour. At the end of the week, they were rescued and all of them were alive except for the one who was calling out the time. He had them change their collective agreement as to what constituted time. It's an agreement. And then they aged accordingly and he couldn't fool himself because he had a watch. You notice why I don't wear a watch, right? So, what... <laughs> He's always asking me what time it is, though. I... <laughs> 
So now I know I'm here. I'm the shill here. That's a... <laughs> so now, now my physical body, which is made up of quite ordinary carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen, if you had to buy the raw material from a what do you call these um, places? Hardware stores. <laughs> if you had to go to a hardware store and buy the basic ingredients of my body, it could cost you seven dollars. With inflation, maybe nine dollars. <laughs> So the physical body, the raw material that makes up my body, the carbon and the hydrogen with the recycled earth, water and air, it's been the same for thousands of years. The carbon I have in my bones right now was the same carbon that was in a cluster of nebulas millennia ago, before the Big Bang, etc. It's the same raw material. And carbon and hydrogen and oxygen cannot age. They haven't. A sugar molecule, which is also what makes up my body, or protein molecule, which are basically carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, selenium, tin, whatever, they can't age. Those elements don't age. So why do I? Why do I? Even if the basic raw material that makes up my body doesn't age, why do I age? Because aging is not on the level of matter. Aging is on the gap. See, what's the difference between carbon and hydrogen or oxygen? Anything. One element or another. It's just the arrangement of the subatomic particles. Just like in the DNA, which is the code of information, it's not the nucleotides, it's the arrangement, it's the sequence. Right. The sequence is in the gap, which is, this gap is qualitatively different from this gap. By virtue of what? By virtue of just a faint intention which is freezing that field of infinite possibilities into a certain manifestation. So aging and entropy are a function of how we structure time in the gap. And if we could learn how to, even at a deep level, if we had a different concept of time as other cultures have, you know, Dr. Alexander Lee from Harvard went to all these other places uh, like the Hindu Kush Mountains, Soviet Georgia, Abkhazia, and all these places in Siberia. Different spectrum of aging. 110 year olds, 115 year olds riding horses, swimming naked in ice cold streams. What was different? It wasn't their diet. In fact, if you give Eskimos vegetarian food and fruit and vegetables, they get rotten teeth, hardening of the arteries, and bad tempers. <laughs> so it's not the diet. It influences us, but it's not that. In these cultures, they had a different concept of what it meant to age and of time. To grow old was to become wiser, to become more respected, to become more loved, to become venerated. If you were old, then you were glamorous. All the young people envied the old. And that translated into a different conception of time, a different processing of time, which is nothing physical, different uh, metabolism of time, different kind of aging. How we conceive time, process it, and metabolize it influences that entropy which is not on the level of matter. And time is a self-interaction generated in the gap. It's generated in the gap. Therefore, if, we, if at the deep level our view of time changes, that causes a mutation in our consciousness. That mutation causes a mutation in the mind which expresses itself as a biological mutation. There are other cultures where they have a view of um, circular time. They don't think in terms of linear time. They think of all activity as circular. So rest, activity, rest, activity, rest, activity, rest. The earth is spinning and spinning and spinning. What's the difference between yesterday and today and tomorrow? The same earth is just spinning on its own axis. The seasons, they come and go. So spring follows uh, winter, and then there's autumn, and there's winter, and fall, and spring, and it keeps going round and round in a circle. And they view that as, li as circular. And the whole notion of time, it's, it's circular. Completely different physiology. As a result of that experience, that time is not linear. The New Guinea Islanders, they don't have a word in their voc vocabulary 
they don't have a word in their vocabulary for getting lost. You know, there isn't a word, which means there is no such interpretation. Well, these New Guinea Islanders have never had the experience of getting lost. <laughs> right, so you can... Because they're in a non-local universe where every place is home. It's the same with the Native Americans when we uh, tried to uh, get them, we tried to buy their land from them. Exactly, they, Chief Seattle. Yeah, That's, they, they you had, must tell them yeah, about it. They Chief. had absolutely no concept in their language for the purchase of land. I mean, how can you own land? You want to give me money for something that you can never own? God owns the land. And sure, we'll take it, but uh, how can it be yours? I they, they just didn't get it. Even reservations, that whole concept, they just they never talked like that. By the way, before I forget, people have been asking me all morning and all afternoon, I just want to introduce to you Dr. Reddy, who is a friend of mine, has worked with me for many, many years. Please stand up, Hema. And she's uh, fully trained in Ayurveda. She's running our Ayurvedic clinic here. And everything I say, she can practice it. I can only say it, she can practice it and better. So I just want you to know for her presence. Thank you. When you say the word Ayurveda, what does that translate to? The word Ayurveda comes from the two Sanskrit roots, Ayus, which means life, Veda, which means knowledge. So Ayurveda means knowledge of life. And it wasn't gleaned from going and dissecting the universe into bits and fragments. Mm -hmm. It came from cognition, from that knowingness that you speak yeah. of, from just being silent, yeah. and then everything is there. We were talking about using the example of strawberry ice cream, which seems to be both of our favorite flavors. Uh, <laughs> and if you wanted, let's say you wanted strawberry ice cream. You're all here in this room today and you wanted to have some strawberry ice cream. And we were talking about how many ways are there to get strawberry ice cream if you want to get it into your world. I mean, literal potential ways for you to have a dish of strawberry ice cream. And the first way is uh, the way that all of you know. That is, you have a thought. It always, as Emerson said, the ancestor to every action is a thought. Right? You have this somehow, the thought, and then there's the thinker of the thought. So the thought is, like I just wanted some water, I'd like to have some strawberry ice cream. And then you get in your car and you drive over to haagen or you get on your bicycle, you go for a walk, and you get yourself some strawberry ice cream. So you, you act upon that thought. Now, that's the lowest level of higher consciousness. I mean, there's, there's not a vegetable plant that knows how to do that. No stone will ever do that. An animal won't do that. But you know how to do that. So that's higher consciousness, but it's still the lower level. And there's much, much, there are many higher levels than that, or there are, there are three. That the three beyond that that we were talking about. Another way, if you want to have strawberry ice cream, is to have a thought, yeah, I'd like to have some strawberry ice cream, and a higher consciousness way is to say to one of your kids, go get me some strawberry ice cream. <laughs> so that you have the thought and somebody else is acting on it, which is really terrific. It's, uh, it was outlawed, it's called slavery, but it's still a, a, a way of, uh, of getting strawberry ice cream into your life. But the next way, I think, is the, is the more interesting way. Well, then the next way is that um, you have the thought and uh, your friend goes by and he says, Hey, Deepak, would you like some strawberry ice cream? I just went to the grocery store and I got some. And then there's a better way. So you have the thought and you open the refrigerator, it's there. There's a better way. You have the thought and you turn around and it's there. And then there's an even better way. You have the thought and you manifest it right before arise. And it all is a function of how local and non-local you can be at mm. the same time. See, if your attention is always on the relative, then it's the relative is the field of change. Then all you see is change, change, change. Mm. If your attention is on the absolute, then it's non-change. The absolute yeah. is the ground of all change. And that is fine, it's great, because it gives you the experience of immortality, but it could get boring after a mm. while. And I say, hey, you know, forever and ever, non-change. Yeah. When you have it simultaneously on the relative and the absolute, that, in that every experience is experienced in terms of its boundaries, but at the same time in terms of its unboundedness, then you've got it. Now, this is something that I've experienced in my life a lot more lately that I've been able to go to this level. This is difficult for him to handle here. But, uh, and what I, what I suggest is that when you 
get to this place that we're alluding to here, which is not a place, that these kinds of events of people walking by and saying, is this your strawberry ice cream? And you say, wow, I was just thinking about that. Ooh, what's going on? How did that happen? Where did that come from? Uh, or you're thinking about your sister and you're just having a conversation with her. You haven't seen her in five years and you go to the phone and, and she's calling or, you know, endless numbers of these kinds of synchronistic events that almost like you have a collaboration with fate um, become they become more frequent, they become more noticeable, they aren't something that you say, oh, how could this happen, isn't, this, isn't that interesting, or it's just chaos, because there's no such thing as chaos, no, is there? it's chaos. The only the appearance of chaos. There is nothing in chaos. It's like when you go to, say, let's say you go to New York City, and the best example I can use of uh, chaos is Grand Central no. Station, okay? Yeah. So everybody is going hither and thither every which way and what, mm. and you think it's chaotic. But each person is going to a specific destination. Mm. And not only that, if you were to announce a track change from track 11 to track mm. 10, you'd see a further intensification of the chaos. Mm. But in fact, it is an elaboration of the underlying order. Mm. So in all this seeming chaos, there's an underlying order. You and it's not only that you should go and get flowers wherever you go. Mm. The Vedic expression is when you're in that state then wherever you go, flowers will bloom. Mm. Yeah. You don't have to wait for them. You choose where you want to go and the flowers will bloom on your path. Yeah, I believe that. I mean, I, I know that. <laughs> and, and <laughs> I do. And I've seen it happen, and I, and I believe you can take this kind of consciousness and make it work, not only for you, but for those around you, or for the world. That the, the thoughts, the images, the vision, the ability to manifest, to create what you want for yourself. You see, if enough of us in the world believe, for example, in a nuclear holocaust, just taking it to something that affects all of us and certainly all of our children who are going to inherit this place from it. If enough of us believe that, that, that's, that exists, doesn't it? I mean, that's a consciousness. That's a, and if enough of us believe it, we will collectively begin to act upon that consciousness, that fear, if you will. Because fear is really, when, when you, there's, to me there's like fear and love in there. You know? I mean, fear is, a hate isn't the opposite of love. Fear is the opposite of love. When you eradicate the fear, like if I'm afraid of something happening, so, uh, an opinion that somebody might have of me, somebody doing something to me that might not, somebody taking my uh, money away from me, somebody, uh, uh, an IRS audit, a, uh, you know, what, whatever it may be that, that is fearful, I'm creating those pheromones that you were talking about, those fearful pheromones. I like that. That could be a rock group. You know. uh, <laughs> the fearful pheromones. Watch. They'll be, they'll be on TV tomorrow. Um, you create that. When, when I have that fearful thought, I find myself, I use a technique that I'm writing about in Real Magic where I just say, I use the word next. <laughs> just like, okay, here's that thought, and I say to myself, next. <laughs> like that thought, I don't need any, I don't need that fearful thought, or that fearful thought is going to create the very thing that it is that I'm uh, anticipating. So I just remind myself of next. And the the stress inside, the anxiety, whatever, seems to dissipate, and I substitute fear with love, with, with harmony, with bliss, with ease, with, con with whatever you want to call that. And the minute that I do that, the minute that I just shift that thought, my physiology changes. I am creating molecules with my mind that create love and harmony instead of, instead of fear, and the problem is gone. <laughs> so this... This quantum mechanical body that I've been speaking about is nothing new. It's, the ancients called it the subtle body and the causal body. It's that which survives your physical death. When two people are talking on the phone, you come up and cut the lines off. What happens to the people? Nothing happens. They're still there. Certain lines of communication have been disrupted for the time being. Or if we were to destroy the walls, which we would never do it, but let's say this, an earthquake came and destroyed the walls and the roof, would, what would happen to the space? Nothing. And this is the room, is the space that we're in. 
Likewise, when the physical body dies, nothing happens to you because you don't live in the physical body. The body lives in you. And the body is that chit akash, that subtle body. Chit in Sanskrit means full of thinking non-stuff. Akash means space, emptiness. Mm -hmm. And when speaking of this body, the rishis say, fire cannot burn it, water cannot wet it, wind cannot dry it, weapons cannot cleave it, it's ancient, it's unborn, it never dies. And yet, even though it's made up of non-stuff, and thinking non-stuff, it has in it all the seeds of every manifestation. When you close your eyes and you see an image flash through the screen of your consciousness, let's say you close your eyes right now and see your mother there or somebody else, your child or your sweetheart or whatever. As soon as you see that image, where is that image? Or when you hear a thought, where is that thought? Or you touch and feel the texture of a rose, in consciousness, or the taste of strawberry ice cream. Where is it? It's not in the material world. It's in Chitakash, it's in that quantum mechanical body. And that is the seed for manifestation. That seed, in its most primordial state, is nothing but a desire. And desire is pure potentiality seeking manifestation. It is the mechanics of creation. And both desire and memory are exactly the same. Desire leads to new memories, the new memories create more desires, etc., etc. So again, the spiritual admonition frequently, lose your desires, is a complete misunderstanding of reality. Without desire, there is no manifestation. Desire is the process. Pure being desiring to itself, may I become the mountains, became the mountains. Pure being desiring to itself, may I become the galaxies, became the galaxies. So it's not that we relinquish our desires, that would be very harmful. In fact, and Ayurveda say, one of the reasons people get ill is they're unable to manifest their desires. And the secret of perfect health is the spontaneous fulfillment of every desire that you've ever had. And the easier the desire is to fulfill, the healthier you will be. So one never curbs one desires, one just finds a better means of manifesting them. And the principle is not through hard work. Hard work can create a lot of stress, and it's part of this ethic that we've, re we've inherited, at least in this part of the world, right. that the harder you work, the better it will be. Well, where do you see that principle in nature? Does nature work hard? Does it have to really work hard to go around the sun every day or for the birds to migrate or the fish to go back to their spawning ground? It's all happening with the principle of do less and accomplish more. And That's ultimately do yeah. nothing and accomplish everything. Then there's you're a, there. There's Absolutely. a one, wonderful story you tell of the Rishis who uh, a student goes to the Rishi and said, I would like to know how long it will take me to I'm very anxious and I want to learn enlightenment. And the Rishi said, if you study with me for 10 years, you'll be there. He said, well, I want to work extra hard. He said, I will work at night, I will work in the day, I will study, I will do everything that I have to can. And the Rishi said, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Deepak, we, uh, I know that there's no such thing as time, but uh, American Airlines is not at the same level that we are. Uh, Okay, there's a quote from Eliot that I think summarizes this in a sense, that mm -hmm. really there's nothing to do. After all this, the final message is there's nothing to do, because as Wayne says, I'm quoting him again, <laughs> we're not human doings, we're human beings. Mm -hmm. And therefore there's nothing to do. And T.S. Eliot says, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started from, and know the place for the first time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, uh, <laughs> thank you, Deepak. My favorite poet is uh, Robert Frost, and he said similar message for all of us. And it's like what I want to say in closing is, if you got what you got out of today is valuable, then understand that. 
the thinker behind the thoughts and every thought you have is something to be really aware of because you're going to manifest in your life exactly what it is that you're thinking. So get real conscious of that and go to that empty place. Robert Frost said it this way, we all sit around in a ring and suppose while the secret sits in the center and knows. Thank you and God bless you.